Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, or depending on how long this takes to edit, a Happy New Year to you. Welcome to something a little bit different on the Mobile Chicane channel. Uh, normally we dwell in the dusty confines of F1 history and leave the previews, reviews and drinks from shoes to other channels. But not today, because for the first time in quite a while we're tackling modern day motoring in what we're dubbing the Tournament of Champions, an alternate season review. Not just another tier list or driver grading video, but a knockout fantasy competition that, theoretically, could end with us crowning Logan Sargent as our 2023 champion. As much as I love the sound of my own voice, I knew a project like this needed some assistance, someone with the same passion for F1, for its statistics and its history, and most importantly, someone who knew how to play the bassoon. With that in mind, there was only one man for the job. Peter Brook, welcome. Hello, Chicane, and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, if you're a fan of this channel, you will almost certainly be subscribed to Peter. And if you're not, sort yourself out. Um, what sort of top quality content could people expect to find over on your channel, Peter? Uh, so very similar to your channel. So I do long form videos on Formula One history. A lot of my videos are over an hour long. The longest one is just under three hours. So I do a mixture of general history, deep dives into backmarker teams and backmarker drivers, and also extremely extensive ranking videos. All the links for Peter's channel and his socials will be in the description. Um, and if you really love the sound of our voices together, you can hear us discuss more about this particular reality of Formula One over on the DRS Train podcast, a weekly F1 show with Peter, but also Nav F1 and Kieran Smith, plus a variety of special guests like myself. Um, again, all the links for that will be down in the description. So what is this Tournament of Champions thing? Well, essentially, we've taken all 22 drivers from the 2023 season, plus 10 Friday practice juniors, shuffled them up and placed them into a 32 driver one-on-one -on -one tournament bracket. Each match will take place at a randomly generated circuit from the 2023 calendar and consist of a three lap race between the two. We'll discuss how we think that might go, the winner marches on through and the loser is ejected quicker than the latest induction to the Red Bull Junior program. And we'll keep going until we have one driver left standing. Now you might be thinking, guys, a fantasy tournament sounds fun and all, but is this not just a longer, more convoluted way of crowning Max Verstappen as the number one driver? Possibly and possibly not. For the fates of these 32 drivers rest not just in the hands of Peter and I, but in the hands of Lady Luck too. For each matchup, we'll have a brief discussion over each driver's season before tackling the meaty matter of who beats who, factoring in their cars, the circuit, and both drivers' inherent strengths and weaknesses. From that discussion, we'll agree upon a set of odds for the match, 6-1, and 5-2, and two, or 4-3, and three, and we'll then roll a die to determine the winner based on those odds. So for instance, in a match between, say, Narain Kartikeyan and Pastor Maldonado, we might assign odds of 2 and 5, meaning a die roll of 1 or 2 would grant victory to Kartikeyan, whilst a 3, 4, 5, 6 or 7 would award it to Maldonado. Now this adds a touch of chance to each match, but also simulates the fact that anything can and does happen in Formula 1, be it collisions, mechanical failures, changeable weather, driver errors, etc. There may well be a very, very niche subsect of the audience who think this concept rings a bell. This is an idea taken from one of my favourite robot combat podcasts, Spinner Proof, which is sadly quite inactive recently, but a few years ago they ran a similar contest as this, albeit with more flamethrowers and axes. So full credit to the guys there for creating this model that we're borrowing for these purposes. And without further ado, on to the tournament itself. We're starting with our first matchup between Zhou Guan Yu and Daniel Ricciardo, and this is taking place at the Red Bull Ring in Austria. Um, Peter, Joe's season, very almost reminiscent of most Alfa Romeo slash Salba drives in a way. It was sort of there in a way, but nothing else really much to discuss in, in some ways. Yeah, by and large invisible, I think. I mean, he had his main standouts, I suppose he had a very good race in Qatar. Um, and then Hungary, he qualified, what, fifth, but then completely fluffed the start. So yeah. that doesn't really bode well for him in terms of expecting good race starts um he had to be i suppose spain as well he was fighting fairly aggressively with sunoda and eventually got that point but otherwise very very anonymous it is not someone as you can easily analyze their driving or their racecraft in that sense because he got so little coverage on camera 
it's a difficult one. I mean, I've, I've, I'm sure I've seen things on like Twitter and TikTok as well where I think people aren't even convinced that Sho Kuan Yu is actually a real person because you so rarely see him either in the races or even outside the car itself. Um, like I said, there were a few highlights. I think you mentioned Hungary and a, he was running in the podium positions. I believe it was in Qatar as well. That aside, it was little to talk about. In fairness to him, I think he was the superior Alfa Romeo driver this year. Um, if you kind of had to pick between the two, but we've not yet seen anything from him that kind of suggests that this is going to sort of, you know, this is the next Verstappen or something like that. He seems a competent midfield driver, but we've not seen um, a whole lot else just yet anyway. Yeah, he's going to add to the long list of drivers that did two or three seasons and did basically nothing. And maybe they, they get remembered 30 years down the line because they had one massive crash, which of course he did. But yeah. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise they, they, they just exist and, and fill a spot on the grid and don't really do much else. Yeah, agreed. Um, we move across to his competitor in this little duel, Daniel Ricciardo, returning to the grid um, after about half a year away. Difficult to kind of analyse just where it kind of if ranks. You know, it was almost neither brilliant, but neither kind of mediocre either. It was sort of we did get some kind of flashes of of promise. I think when he first came back in Hungary, he looked pretty strong. And, you know, we always have to talk about Mexico as well, where, you know, he, he arguably should have scored a top six position there where it's not for the kind of the safety car there as well. But then at other times he was kind of overshadowed by Sonoda there as well. So difficult to see kind of where he is and kind of how he compares to sort of the Ricardo we saw at McLaren or even Renault. Yeah. He didn't really get into a rhythm is the problem because he came back and then almost immediately broke his hands and had to miss several races. And then after coming back was just, yeah, he stood out in Mexico. He was, because the car was obviously competitive there because Tsunoda was going for points as well until he spun. But the other races, yeah, he was just basically invisible, just kind of around at the back and not helped by Alpha Tari's pit strategies being useless. But um, yeah, the, the car's pace is kind of inconsistent, but he was just, again, fairly anonymous for, for, for Ricardo. I think. Not, not really the comeback he wanted, and it didn't really go the way I think that he wanted it to go. No, I, you know, you could have, he probably would have wanted to come back and absolutely, you know, trounce Sonoda and kind of leave no questions asked as to whether he was kind of deserving of that uh, potential Red Bull drive that he's kind of eyeing up in the future. And I didn't really get a concrete answer from that. If anything, maybe Sonoda slightly edged him in kind of that kind of head-to-head respect. Um, in, in terms of this matchup here, so one thing we should clarify is that all the drivers, they are in the machinery they, they ran in this, this year. There, Joe is in his Alfa Romeo, Ricardo is in an Alfa Tauri. Um, the reason kind of we've also got these different circuits as well, it adds another touch of um, difference and, and a randomness to it as well. But also you've got to consider you know, different cars have been at different levels throughout the year. You know, to put someone in Aston Martin is a wide kind of parameter on how good that is at the beginning of the year. That's a fantastic car. And towards the end, not so much as well. And almost kind of the inverse for a McLaren as well. Um, if we look at kind of where these cars were around Austria time, there's not much really to choose from them in terms of a difference between who's got the faster car. Both operations were kind of in the lower midfield in Austria. Obviously, we didn't have Ricardo there. But from where I'm standing, there's not a huge kind of difference in the same way that when we have maybe a, a Red Bull against a Williams or something like that, there's not much difference in, in car potential there. Yeah, it's fairly subtle with these two. I mean, they were both, I would say, by and large inconsistent, but the Alpha Tauri more so because it spent most of the first half of the year as effectively the slowest car. Yeah. And then suddenly got better because they introduced a lot of um, upgrades near the end, but then it would still have occasional races where it was absolutely nowhere. Whereas the Alpha, Tau, uh, Alpha Romeo was basically destined for Q1 eliminations, except for in Qatar, where it was suddenly good, but otherwise was just middling it, like not quite obviously slow enough to be slowest, but just very near the back. So the average pace is quite similar. And, but when you look at their results from Austria, the, both Alphas beat both, both Alpha Romeos, beat both Alpha Tauris. So at that point in the season, it was the faster car. But um, yeah, they, they were, it was because the field spread was so small this year. 
it was hard to determine a definitive pecking order except for Red Bull, basically. Absolutely. And I think you're going to struggle to find that even in Austria as well, given it's such a short circuit as well. Um, naturally, things are going to be bunched up a lot more. I mean, one thing we should touch on is that Austria was obviously the home of one of the more almost ridiculous races of the year, if you like, where there were just so many kind of track limits, uh, penalties being expunged. But this. There were so many kind of at the end of the race, not really kind of a factor with something like this, wherein we've kind of got this three lap shootout between the two cars. I mean, it's unlikely that we're going to kind of see any kind of penalty being introduced. So this really just comes down to a straight race between what is essentially two very even kind of footed cars and drivers as well, which if, you know, a few years back, if you were saying about Ricardo and Zhou Guan Yu, you know, that's, that's almost ludicrous in a way, but it shows kind of both kind of how far back Ricardo's fallen in a way, but also I think Zhou has improved a little bit as well. I know we talked about kind of his anonymity, but he does have sort of a strong kind of midfield presence when, when he is on the pace. Yeah. Um, it's just that it's not it's not very often. This is the thing. He's not he's not doing enough to really capture your attention. I mean, he's good. He 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 kind of stands out. He's put himself um, off track. He kind of stands out because similar to Lewis, he has these quite extravagant outfits he wears, and he mm-hmm. even got cornrows recently. Or he got his hair braided. That, he, got yeah. his, or he got his hair braided recently, so it feels like he's trying to imitate Lewis mm-hmm. in terms of his off track persona. But yeah, on track, he's just really not... He's just very forgettable. He's had a couple of good races. I mean, Canada last year was another one that was good for him. Most people, again, really... His, in, as I said before, in 20 and 30 years' time, he's mostly going to be remembered for his crash at Silverstone, I think. Mm. And being the first Chinese driver. But we don't see... We don't see much. I mean, uh, one thing that stood out... Zandvoort this year, um, I think he and Bottas in the rain, they got up near the front... They played the strategy well. He had an opportunity to actually battle with Lewis and defend against him, and he just kind of let him pass. Mm. And it's like, how many other times are you going to have a chance to fight against Lewis, even if you're technically racing together? And he just didn't do anything with that. Um, And it's things like that where you kind of... Somebody like Tsunoda would not have just let him through. He would have tried to, to defend against it, but he just let him go past. Yeah, I think this is this is. I think we're starting off with a very close matchup here. I think we're looking at a four and three. I kind of want to give the edge to Ricardo in a way, simply because, you know, either, either, whether he we think he's starting first in this race or starting second. If he's behind, I think Ricardo is more likely to have a go at Joe. And this may be nostalgia talking, thinking about sort of all those those brilliant overtakes we've seen from Ricardo over the years, but. I feel like he's more inclined to kind of have a go and make something stick, whereas Joe, I, I don't know, I don't see that same kind of edge from him. It's just the, it's the lack of data with Joe. We've just seen him mess up a few race starts, but otherwise it's just right, running around like between like 13th to 17th. It's not something you're really going to notice much in terms of if he does have good starts. And if he does have good starts, it's mostly him keeping himself out of trouble rather than, you know, just blitzing everyone at the beginning. But yeah, it, it, Ricardo in that sense is much more well documented as a driver because we've seen so much more of his racecraft because he used to be in front running teams and he's been around for a very long time now. Mm. And so he's someone that he is more of a known quantity, although I don't, I, he doesn't stand out in my eyes as someone known for having particularly impressive race starts. But he just, he has, I think he has the advantage of, even if the car is worse, he has the advantage of experience on his side. Yeah, I think if we're looking for an edge in, in this kind of matchup, I think experience is probably uh, the thing that's just going to nudge it in favour of Daniel. So are we going to agree on a, on a four and three in favour of Ricardo? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so I'm going to roll the die now. Hopefully we'll pick up some nice foley on it as well. So because of the way that these are laid out in the matchup, Joe comes first. So this is technically uh, three against four. So if we roll a one, two or a three... It's a win for Zhou Guan Yu, and if it is a four, five, six, or seven, Daniel Ricciardo goes through. So, first roll of the tournament. It is a five. Daniel Ricciardo wins. Okay. Okay, so on to match two, and this is Pierre Gasly against Kevin Magnussen, and this is an Interlagos in Brazil, or the Sao Paulo Grand Prix, as we should call it. I mean, as a circuit, it's one that's got fond memories for both drivers. We'll start with Pierre Gasly this year. 
pretty pretty solid, pretty decent. Obviously, he had that podium um, in in Zandvoort, was it? Yeah, yeah, Zandvoort. So pretty good. I mean, the, the Alpinas was sort of we touched on this when we were we we chatted on the DRS train podcast, but you know, it's it's been, the Alpine kind of machinery has been one that's sort of sandwiched in the middle between those front runners like McLarens and Aston Martins or something like that, but ahead comfortably of the likes of Alfa Romeos and Alfa Tauris in the world. So they, they've picked up points on odd occasions and obviously a couple of podiums as well. But other than that, yeah, it, it's difficult to kind of analyse just how good Gasly has been this year because we've either seen him at the front or we've not seen him at all. Well, once McLaren broke ahead, Alpine were left with nobody to fight with, essentially, um, other than themselves. And obviously we saw a lot of that because we, they, they came together in uh, Australia and then again in uh, Hungary, although I don't know if that was so much their fault. I think they just both got hit by the same person or they one of them was hit by someone and then turned into, into the other. Yeah, pretty even between the two, to be honest, although Ocon was the more reckless of the two. But Gasly, he, he's someone who, once he left Red Bull, he just kind of found his mojo again. He was very good at Toro Rosso. First couple of years have been supreme out at Alpha Tauri, um, especially 2021 when the car was quite competitive and he was mm. very often top ten and getting Q3 in in qualifying and that and that. But yeah, and so but this time you can see there is just the, the tension is there because they play they play you know friendly, but they obviously we, everyone knows those two don't get on. The team is just kind of rudderless and leaderless at the moment. I don't know what's going on, going on there as well. So yeah, he just had it was a relatively steady year, I guess. Um, but eventually, he'll probably want a car that's a bit more competitive again. I think steady is a great way to kind of describe both Alpine years. You know, conversely, if we want to talk about things that are unsteady, we could kind of look at that Haas performances throughout this year, which so regularly was really, really good during qualifying, but then absolutely kind of fell to pieces on race day. Kevin Magnussen. I guess kind of included in that, I feel like Hulkenberg was a little stronger when it came to qualifying performances. Magnussen does have kind of three points finishes to his name this year, which is not too bad, but they were all kind of 10th places. And that was maybe kind of the best he could kind of squeeze out of that car. You know, on surface appearance, it wasn't as impressive as the previous year had been. Obviously, he scored his pole um, at Sao Paulo in, in 2022. This year didn't really get as many chances to shine. I think Barr um he started very high up in miami i believe it was but apart from that we didn't see too much of him yeah hulkenberg beat him pretty much everywhere is the thing he i don't think he did enough to warrant um having his seat again because last year he he was with grosjean gone and him coming back he was now the senior driver because he was alongside mick but then hulkenberg is older and more experienced than him and he hasn't. Holkerberg had several really good qualifyings, and then they would go wrong in the races because they pass just can't seem to make a car that works on Sunday. But otherwise, yeah, so many Q1 eliminations, just nowhere near points, just doing basically nothing, and just being being very anonymous and just not doing anything interesting. And this is one of the disappointments of certain teams having the same lineup as as this year for next year. Is that it's like. That there's this unwillingness to try and be interesting or take a risk or do something different. Mm -hmm. I'll just stick with these two very boring drivers. Because I think now Mazepin and Schumacher seem to have put Gunter off wanting rookies for life. Mm -hmm. He's only going to want no known quantities. But Magnussen is just not... There's not any of that pizzazz that he used to have. It seems to have just gone. No, and, and Haas, I think, are definitely one of the teams that are more guilty than most of being a little afraid to kind of shake it up. You know, I think during when you had that Grosjean Magnussen era there, so long during that kind of that time there, I was thinking one of these guys has, has got to go, not necessarily because they are, are bad, but something needs shaking up, something different needs to happen there. And they sort of stubbornly refused to do it. Then they did do it with Schumacher and Mazepin, and it sort of kind of, they almost kind of gone, well, this is why we didn't, we didn't want to change things up because, you know, it goes <laughs> as badly as this. So... I, I, I see what you mean. I think Magnussen was absolutely outperformed by Hulkenberg this year. In many ways, kind of lucky to stay on this year, but in, in many other ways, lucky that he's at Haas and his seat's fairly secured as long as they kind of want to keep him around for and they're not going to plan on shaking things up anytime soon. 
in terms of the matchup between these two, if we look at kind of their record, um, particularly as we isolate during how they were at Sao Paulo, Alpine, Gasly, pretty average in qualifying, but they did score points on race day. Whereas Haas and Magnussen, they were out in Q1 and then both crashed out at the start, crashing together and with Alex Albon as well. So no huge data point for kind of how well Haas might have been that day. I think the favour is kind of tipped towards Gasly for this one. I don't think it's as, as heavy as a six and one, but maybe maybe five and two. Yeah, I think Magnussen, he's not someone I know for particularly strong race starts. And I mean, mercifully for Haas, even three laps isn't long enough for them, for their tyres to fall to pieces. Yeah. But yeah, the, 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 the Alpine, particularly at this stage of the season, was obviously the better car. And Gasly, again, someone who has better starts and, and, and that. Even though, you know, Magnussen will go very aggressive at the start, that often doesn't work out too well for him. Yeah. So yeah, this leans quite heavily in favour of Gasly. Yeah, I think it's de- it's definitely favourite. I mean, is it is it a six in one? Maybe. I mean, in my mind, I'm kind of reserving that for when we've got very clear cut matches um, later on. But I'm trying to think of a way that Magnussen wins this, considering he is in worse machinery. It's not likely that he's going to get by at the start. He's almost certainly going to be behind if we sort of ran a qualifying session as well. Is he just relying on a mistake from Gasly or, or if he does get that sort of wondrous star or maybe if there is some contact, he comes better off? Mm. You can only really rely on it having a bad start, I think, from Gasly because otherwise the, 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 ball, the, the ball is really in, in Alpine's court. Mm-hmm. It's better, particularly on, a, particularly on a Sunday, it's better in all areas than the Haas. Even though the Haas, maybe their first stint is usually okay but it's as you get later into the race that the tire the tires create problems with them and they just drift backwards but then magnuson yeah he's had some not brilliant starts i remember one um i saw this from the onboard he almost missed the start um baku 2018 because he was adjusting something on the steering wheel and then the lights came on and he was just like shit and suddenly grabs the wheel with like <laughs> a, a half a second to spare and still manages to get the car going but nearly missed the start completely yeah, it's, there's the thing that the Haas doesn't really is is not so good in this kind of situation. If it was a qualifying battle, you could say, well, it'd be closer, but not so much in a race like this. Yeah, yeah, but I think if we did run that qualifying situation and they did pull a really good Haas thing out of it, I think there's every chance that Gasly's just getting by at the start anyway, or if not, he can happily kind of bide his time and then just zoom straight through once that DRS kind of opens on that third lap. Mm. What do we say? We say six and one or five and two. Uh, let's make it five and two, I think. All right. I'll trust your judgment on this one. So one through five for Pierre Gasly and a six or a seven for Kevin Magnussen. It is a five. Ooh. Pierre Gasly moves through. On to match number three. We have Lance Stroll against Frederick Vesti. And this is our first instance of introducing one of our Friday practice drivers into this. Partly because they neatly top it, top it up to a nice 32 neat driver bracket but you know we've seen at least some data from them this year of running in formula one so for all of these friday practice drivers they will be in the machinery that they entered friday practice in so in this case frederick vesti will be driving the mercedes we'll touch on lance stroll first thoughts on lance stroll's season not brilliant really he kind of picked it up at he was kind of okay at the beginning because the car was good and then he picked it up a little bit at the end but the middle period was really not brilliant for him he was at first it was looking like well he alone is costing them potentially second in the constructors and then of course we realized okay the car itself has obviously gotten worse because fernando's falling back as well he ended up almost almost taking fourth from mclaren at the end because he had this sudden surge in form but otherwise just very poor and that's just the way it is with him he's been around for six years now and Every once in a while, he has a good race, and then that's enough to keep him going. That they'll take that as any excuse to to keep him in, and that'll keep him going for another five years. But it's time to get for, for, to put someone more deserving in. I think he's taking up some very valuable seats. Yeah, it's it statistically, it's very weird. This is technically Lance Stroll's most successful season, and this is the first time he's finished in the top ten of the drivers' championship. But results-wise, when you consider just what Alonso achieved in the Aston Martin, to not even get a singular podium with it, okay, you've normally most of the time you've had, you know, kind of Red Bull locking out at least two of those positions, and it's been a scrap between several others to kind of get that other one. But 
there were, uh, the fact that there was never an instance where it seemed likely that that Stroll was going to get a podium seems almost bizarre. You know, I agree. He, he does have these flashes of promise, and I think I do look back on his you know his twenty twenty season very favourably. He did very well in the racing point that year. He was as high as fourth in the drivers' championship at one point that year, and arguably should have won Turkey that year as well. But yeah, it, it, it's beginning to get to the point where if Aston Martin do genuinely have you know, ambitions to be a world championship winning team, they have to sit down and think seriously, is Lance Stroll, first of all, I, it doesn't seem he's the kind of driver to deliver that championship, but nor does it seem he's the kind of person who can support someone in delivering that championship as well. There's a lot of kind of decisions to be made when it comes to the driver market next year. And I think the most interesting around them is going to be what Aston Martin does and what they choose to do with Lance Stroll. I know so many people have always said, oh, well, as you know, his dad owns the team. He's got a seat for life. I, I don't think it's as cut and dry as that. You know, I think Lawrence Stroll is a very ruthless kind of businessman. He knows what you need to do to kind of succeed. And just because, you know, your son is in a Formula One seat, if you the means to succeed is by putting someone else in there. I can't see him hesitating to do something like that. Yeah, I mean, we've seen there's been a bit of a dissension in the ranks this year because everyone's general assumption was, okay, well, he's long, he's there as long as Lawrence wants to be there. Mm. But we've seen, obviously, rumours that Stroll himself is getting increasingly fed up and it came that way in, in races where things went wrong. It it's, it's came across that way in interviews that he just isn't interested anymore. He's lost his motivation. And then again, his dad, Lawrence, selling some of his shares in the team as well is that that was starting to fuel rumours that he, he himself was going to sell the team completely at which point Lance would lose his seat and it's someone else's turn to do it but yeah aside from bringing in money he's little more than a liability because he just can't he can't put the results in and he just doesn't even seem to have the drive or the willingness to put the results in there's no there's no sense that he's really pushing himself he's just kind of because he comes across so nonchalant and just so unenthusiastic you don't get that that sense and this is the complete opposite of, of Alonso who gives a hundred percent all the time and you just don't get that at all from from lance and it just it feels it feels like a wasted seat to have been around this long and to have had chances in what but this year and 2020 particularly were some pretty good cars as well mm -hmm. that should have really gone to somebody else well it's part in this is frederick vesti who is not a formula one driver but drove in free practice for mercedes Solid F2 campaign, you know, challenging for the title there as well. His appearances in Friday practice were pretty decent as well. There's sort of a running trend if you kind of run through all of these where a lot of people had their first kind of run out in Mexico, which obviously was a circuit quite unfamiliar to a lot of these junior drivers. They've not had any time there in a, in a junior category, so they, they definitely struggled. But once they went to Abu Dhabi, a little closer to kind of that leading pack. And we take this with a pinch of salt. We don't know what fuel people were running how hard they were pushing what kind of simulations they were running we can only kind of judge on the data that we've been given and the, the data here says that in abu dhabi vesti finished 12th in friday practice which pretty solid but also consider that about half the field at that point were also junior drivers but time wise he was only 0.2 seconds behind stroll there and just 0.7 seconds behind what russell was producing who, who topped that session as well so flickerings of potential there from Vesti as well and obviously he was discussed in regards to that Williams seat which he didn't get how did you feel about kind of Vesti's year and maybe his prospects moving forward well generally a good one obviously he was fighting for the title and despite winning six races in Formula 2 he lost the title to a driver that won one because most of his six wins were sprint races but also it was it was just a, it was another year of just general inconsistency in Formula 2 from everybody it really went off the rails. It was towards the end because he, he was involved in a crash that wasn't his fault in Monza. And then all of his wheels came off in Zandvoort. And that's what really made the difference, I think. And yeah, he did briefly look like a contender for the second Williams seat until they re-signed Logan. Because again, he's a Mercedes junior. But And this is something I've mentioned in the podcast, is that we talk about Mercedes. They've got him. And then there's also Paul Aaron and most importantly, Kimi Antonelli in the works all fighting for a Mercedes seat, although that's locked out for the next two years because George and Hamilton are staying until the end of 25. So he's got some competition if he does want to get an F1 seat, assuming he stays with Mercedes or gets a Mercedes-adjacent team, such as Williams or possibly even McLaren or Aston Martin. Mm -hmm. But he's not an obvious standout driver in the way that people look at, you know, Oscar Piastri or, you know, yeah, Kimi Antonelli, Teo Poutre, 
Ollie Behrman. He just doesn't have that same oomph, I guess. But he did show his willingness to fight for the title. He had a very good final weekend in Formula 2. A very aggressive driver, definitely. But it's not like a... Not an not an S tier amongst the juniors, I don't think. No, he, he's not kicking down the door to get into Formula One. But I think if a seat does kind of open up and it does kind of work that way, and there's a potential there, it, it's one that his hopes kind of re- rely on sort of this musical chairs that's going to play out next year to kind of fall in favour of him. You know, he's not going to be the first one kind of snaffled up by someone. But if there is a vacancy and it is a logical fit, he he may well end up there. We'll see what happens there. I mean, in regards to this kind of matchup, it's in favour of Stroll for me, but I don't think it's overwhelmingly in favour. I appreciate that we're, you know, we're com- comparing someone with six years Formula One experience to someone with absolutely none. But like I sort of showed, you know, Vesti's had some solid results in those free practices. He was not far behind Stroll in Abu Dhabi. We're racing at Silverstone, which is a circuit he knows, um, and when he won the sprint race in F2 this year, conversely, Stroll did not have a good race at Silverstone this year. You know, had that collision with Gasly and finished outside the points. Um, you know, a very much kind of rinse repeat of the majority of the year where he just failed to match kind of what Alonso was doing. I'm tempted to put it as a five and two in favour of Stroll. I think it's closer than that because the, Vesti's in the Mercedes, so that was a clearly better car at Silverstone. Because Silverstone was the it was the first weekend when you could really see things were going downhill for Aston Martin. Because obviously Spain was a bit anticlimactic, but at this race Alonso finished seventh, but was just very very invisible. It was very close at the front. With um, well, McLaren had this sudden surge, but Mercedes were close as well. So yeah, the Mercedes in this form, the Mercedes is definitely the better car. But again, Stroll has the advantage of experience, and he's a far less aggressive driver than Vesti. On race starts, he's someone who sometimes has quite good ones, but mostly by just staying out of trouble rather than having a good launch or or making decisive maneuvers or anything. For me, I'm leaning on Vesti's side in on the basis that he's in the better car and he's a very aggressive driver. So you say we should give the advantage to Vesti on this one? Um, or are you arguing still in favour of Stroll but but closer, maybe four three to Stroll? Is that what we you you want to put forward? On the basis of experience, yeah, I think maybe a 4-3, even though it's a very short race. I think it's close. I I felt bad just upgrading it from a 6-1 to a 5-2. and two. I don't know. The thing is, Avesti is, is an unknown. And I think he can overcome some of, the, sort of that inexperience by bumping up to a 5-2. I don't know if I would feel confident enough to call this closer than that. Yeah, it's just his, he's more aggressive, but he is, is more reckless at the same time. He's someone, I think he's someone who's more likely to get involved in a first lap squabble with somebody. Now I think about it, 4-3 almost kind of makes sense in a way, because it, it's almost a coin flip in a way, because you're not only kind of trying to pick between the two, but it's almost who's going to make that reckless move on the other, or who's going to misjudge a timing. That's almost what we're kind of rolling for here in a way. It's not necessarily a case of who beats who on pure pace, but it's who makes that mistake and comes out worse off. Yeah. I suppose both of them have had some quite sizable crashes mm. in the past. Yeah, the, they're, they're both prone to mistakes. Vesti because of being aggressive and inexperienced and Stroll just because he just makes mistakes a lot. But it, again, it, thinking about Silverstone, the, the Mercedes was the better car. That's yeah. the thing. That's why I'm leaning, I think, on the 4-3 to Vesti. 4-3 in favour of Vesti? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this is so interesting because you know, I run through so you almost kind of are we going to have to do a do, do, are we going to have to do a heads or tails to see who <laughs> just to see who's picks who's or three for for which one yeah and then do it. well I would okay here's what I'm going to argue because you want to do four three for Vesti and I wanted to do five two for Stroll so I say we meet in the middle or we do a four three for Stroll yeah yeah we can do that so, one to four for Lance Stroll, five, six, seven for Frederick Vesti. It is a four, which means Ooh. our decisions made a difference. Yeah. Lance Stroll goes through. Okay, match four. And we have Max Verstappen against Carla Sainz. And we're doing this at Suzuka in Japan. We briefly spoke before we started this episode. There's not many instances where Max Verstappen isn't going to be the overwhelming favourite. And this is potentially one of those which might maybe be a little closer. I mean, 
we can talk briefly about Max Verstappen. I don't know what else there is to say, really, given, you know, it's been unseen kind of dominance from one person this year. More or less flawless as well. Certainly no mistakes on a mechanical point of view, apart from, uh, was it qualifying in, in Saudi? That was his only mechanical. I mean, he almost every race he was complaining about downshifts or the brake feeling funny. I mean, he nearly had some brake failure at Cota right at the end. But otherwise, yeah, com- a complete clean sweep in terms of reliability. And yeah, as a driver near faultless, I mean, only some very minor errors in terms of um, a slightly poor start at Las Vegas, for example. But really, really minor stuff. It's not like it used to be. Go back five, six years when he was having consistently really bad race starts and getting involved in a lot of accidents. That just doesn't happen nearly as often now. It's really hard to find fault with him in his 2023 form. Yeah, there was almost kind of an inevitability about every race you had with Verstappen this year because we've had instances of dominance in the past, but there would be occasions where oh, Hamilton's got to take a, a grid penalty or, or Schumacher's made a mistake at, at this point or other, which shuffled them further down the grid. You thought, oh, okay, we've got a, got a race here, we've got something different. But even when that's happened to Max, it's just sort of, he's sort of cruised through the pack and there's been no problems at all. Yeah, ad- inevitable, I suppose, is, is, is the one way you might describe Max's season. Compare that to Carlos Sainz, the one non-Red Bull driver to, to win a race this year. And definitely kind of a more fluctuation in terms of the year. Obviously, Singapore was absolutely brilliant, a real kind of tactical masterclass in terms of kidding the others back in the DRS zone and sort of holding them off to take the win that day. But at other times, not so strong. So a, a tricky one to analyse just kind of where he winds up. Yeah, he just he had only three podiums this year, which is kind of ridiculous, even though he scored points in almost every race. I mean, the only race he finished that he didn't score points on was Australia, but that was because of that penalty he got at the end. But yeah, Leclerc had more podiums, but again, was similarly just mostly between fourth and sixth was where he was finishing most of the time. I don't remember Ferrari, those two, necessarily having particularly bad starts. He's someone who, again, is often very aggressive at the start. Mm-hmm but would just have some rather invisible races or races class, as we see a lot, just ruined by strategy, basically. I just found it funny, for example, at the end of Cota, when he was trying to chase down um, Leclerc or, or Norris, whoever it was, and him him and his race engineer were like, yeah, let's go, final 10 laps, and then five laps, and he's like, yeah, I can't catch him. My, <laughs> my tyres are dead. Yeah. Or something. Broadly speaking, a good season. I mean, he showed, and this is one of the differences, and we saw this... Um, at Singapore he's clearly quite intellectual and he has a very very good technical understanding he can think on his feet in terms of strategies in a way that Leclerc can't Leclerc is always just dependent on the team to work it out for him Sainz he knows how to play the game but a lot of the time the car is just not what he needs to be able to play it properly that's the that's the issue clearly an intellect an intellectual driver who understands strategy has a good under- technical understanding knows how to set the car up and all of that stuff that just didn't have as good a car as Red Bull. Yeah, he's a very clever driver, which I don't think he gets enough credit for. I think the problem that a lot of people will see a lot of the time is not that kind of intelligence, but the differences in pace. And a lot of a lot of the time, and I'm mostly kind of thinking about last year when Ferrari were a lot better, but Leclerc tends to be the one ahead in races and by a decent gap as well. It was a little bit closer this year, but sort of an out-and-out pace, you'd put Leclerc ahead. But for this one... This is a tricky one. I don't think there's any instances this year where, or so I should say any of these potential matchups where Max Verstappen is as low as kind of a four and three. I think he's had such a kind of superiority that bar maybe those three races that he didn't win, and even then you've got to factor in it's those that did actually beat him that day. So is this is this five and two, or is that just me not wanting to keep giving Max Verstappen constant advantages? I think it could be a five and two because again, Max, most of his strengths seem to be late stages of the race. There were a lot of races where sometimes he would lose the start and then catch it again, and retake it again, lose the lead and then retake it again, or was it would remain close for the first five ten laps and then eventually he would storm ahead. It wasn't like Vettel where he would blitz the start and get himself out of DRS range by the end of the first lap and you'd never see him again. Max would sort of get into a rhythm and then it was in the final stint that he would then get bring out like build out like a 30 second lead usually held by Ferrari's strategies being useless. So yeah, opening stints it was 
relatively close, I think, a lot of times between him and, him and Ferrari because they would try and push it and see if they could get him to, into a mistake or if they could keep up with him and then quickly realize they can't. So I think a, far, a yeah, I think a, a five and two is is fair. Yeah, I think if there's any kind of matchup, it's between a driver who has won a race this year and we know is is a very good driver. I'm just kind of thinking about the layout of Suzuka as well and where defensive maneuvers might be made and where overtaking might happen. There's obviously quite a few very high speed areas where the Red Bull's going to have a massive kind of advantage over that Ferrari. I think I think we'll stick we'll stick with five and two before I try and talk myself out of it any further. Yeah, yeah. So one to five for Max Verstappen and a six or a seven for Carlos Sainz. Um, we've not had an upset yet, so I think we, we're due one. I think that's how probability works with these sort of things. It is a one. Oh, okay. Max Verstappen wins. <laughs> As with all things, Max Verstappen this year, inevitable. Yeah. Match five, and we come to two of my favourite drivers on the grid. We have Oscar Piastri against Alex Albon in Qatar. Starting with Oscar Piastri, I think it's been a really good rookie season for him. I think what's impressed me, I think, more than getting the podiums, getting that sprint win as well, is the fact that he kind of got on with his job while he could when the McLaren wasn't on the pace, and he was pretty much faultless. I can't think of any major errors he made when he was kind of struggling at that midfield. But as soon as that car kind of switched on and, and was ready to fight at the front, he just kind of transitioned so smoothly into that operation. And again, he still wasn't making mistakes. He wasn't making rash errors, which you would anticipate other kind of younger drivers to do as soon as they cut that opportunity further up the field. I'm not going to jump on the bandwagon of people sort of saying, oh, he's ready to kind of replace Norris as, as that team leader there, I think Norris still has the advantage there for him, but I was still really impressed with kind of what Oscar did this year, especially after a year away from racing as well. Yeah, um, he well, he kind of experienced everything this year, having a really bad car at the beginning and then a really good car at the end. And I guess if you count the sprint as a win, he did win a race as well. His qualifying, he showed himself to be basically as good as Lando, but where, and this is where obviously experience comes into play, he wasn't so good at tyre management. Um, and he often fell behind, like final stints in races, he would often lose time and and, and that because, again, you, that's tyre management and everything. That's just something that comes of experience. He only got two two podiums in the end, whereas Lando got seven. So that's quite a difference. And that's where the points difference comes because Lando actually got more than double his points tally, even though they were both scoring points at more or less the same places. But Piastri, I don't remember him having any accidents off the top of my head just generally very strong for, for a rookie. He did what you would expect, really, of just playing it safe and having some kind of real standout moments. And Qatar was one of those because he won the sprint and people were saying, well, if they hadn't messed qualifying up, he could have won the race. I don't think that's the case. Max still was going to win it. But this was one of their strongest circuits, certainly Qatar. Absolutely. I think, you know, if we'd gone round to all the drivers before starting this and asked them to pick out what circuit they'd, they'd like to be racing at, Oscar Piastri is almost certainly picking Qatar for this one. This was absolutely kind of his strongest one of the year. Conversely, so we've got the guy in the opposite corner, Alex Albon. As a Williams fan, he has lifted my spirits plenty this year with so many great kind of battling drives, lots of point scoring positions, great qualifyings on occasion as well. It was far from kind of a, a fault, faultless kind of campaign for him. I think even me with my martini striped rose tinted glasses could admit that as well there were so many instances where you'd see a driver warning flash up on the screen for someone going over track limits and it would inevitably be alex albon doing that so far from perfect but still a, a really really good year for him i think his teammate flattered him because he gave him so little competition i think it made it look as if albon was out driving the car when i think more often it was just sergeant in driving it or under driving it but yeah he had he had he finished seventh twice those are his strongest results again this is a, a car that works really well and this has been the case with williams because they're mercedes engine merchants that you could summarize them in the hybrid era as just mercedes but shit the whole time <laughs> because they're just gr great in a straight line but just can't do anything else and that's continued this time because again really good monza canada 
and um, apart from in the final stint um, Las Vegas, all circuits of long straights and low speed corners where he can defend well. But otherwise, he did have a lot of races of just being invisible and just driving around, you know, 13, 14, 15. He it was kind of a tire whisper that would do these unnaturally long stints, but they would try this all the time and it didn't always work. So he would have races where the tires just fell, fell to pieces, such as Vegas, where both drivers in the first stint were running in the points and then they both finish outside the points. Yeah. Because they tried to do one stop strategies. But again, this was not, Qatar was not a strong circuit for them. Um, they were both running around near the back. I mean, Albon, he did well in the sprint and then he was kind of near the front, but again, fell backwards as the race went on. Logan obviously was not feeling well and then the heat didn't help that. And, and then you, and conversely, it's a really, really strong circuit for McLaren. So this isn't really, this isn't really a good matchup for Albon, I don't think. It's not. My, my dreams of Alex Albon coming out on top of this competition are dashed very early here by a very kind of overwhelming favouritism to, to Piastri in this kind of matchup. Yeah, Williams were, I, I want to agree with what you said. I think it, there is potentially he did flatter to deceive. And I think part of that is down to having Logan in the other car. It makes it very difficult for us to judge exactly how good the Williams that this year was, whether you know, Logan was underachieving or whether Alex was overachieving or whether that was the benchmark and it was, that's, that, that's where it was. This is a real heart versus head kind of, sort of working out the statistics of this one, because I, I want it to be closer than it is, but I, I, I think it's six and one to Piastri. Yeah. I'm thinking that as well. It's not, um, it, it's very one-sided, a strong circuit for, for McLaren and a weak circuit for Williams. Yeah, put this anywhere else, and I think this is a closer matchup, but we have to judge it on the fact that they're racing at Qatar, and Piastri clearly loves it there. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's, I think it's in favour of him. So, a seven for Alex Albon, and everything else for Oscar Piastri. It is a five. Oscar Piastri goes through. And all my hopes rest on Logan Sargent. Match six, we are on to Lando Norris against Nick De Vries, and this is taking place at Monza in Italy. We, we touched on Lando very briefly then when we were discussing Oscar Piastri. A lot of people waxing lyrical about what a strong kind of year it's been for him. Where, where are you kind of sitting in that debate, Peter? I think generally strong. I think he's had better years. Like 2020 was a, good, was a very good year. 2021 until Sochi was a good year because that that just kind of broke him and the team because for the rest of the year they were just completely invisible and they lost their battle for third with Ferrari and I think he still has flashbacks and he hasn't quite got over that because now he's tied with uh, Nick Heidfeld for most podiums without a win they're both on 13 and Lando has done that in three years whereas it took Heidfeld 10 yeah. So, you know, it, 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 I don't think it's going to be long before he breaks that record. A win will come eventually. I mean, this year he finished second six times. Once the car got good, it was a really good year. But he would have the odd race where he was rattled because he, like Abu Dhabi, the last race, he messed up qualifying. And also because Piastri would be beating him a lot. And he, I guess, doesn't like that. Well, nobody likes to, be, to be, have a rookie be that close to them, particularly because Lando's been around. This is his fifth season now. And he's someone who they keep they keep saying he might go to Red Bull. I think he should stay at McLaren. It's a, they've got a good thing going on there, him and them, and he can he can stay long term and build the team around him. Even if a, a Oscar is maybe threatening that a bit. Overall, it was a very strong season. The thing is, Monza was not a particularly good circuit for McLaren because he finished eighth, and then Piastri finished outside the points. He had that collision with Lewis, but it just wasn't as good a, a circuit as um, as some of the other ones, especially Qatar. No, obviously McLaren struggled a lot at the beginning part of the year. And this was kind of a, a very rare little blip kind of during this sort of little renaissance, if you want to call it. They did struggle. And I think that does, does make the matchup a little bit more interesting as well. It, it was a very good year for Lando Norris. And I think six runner-up positions without a win, I think, is a record in a single year. I, I've only done a very cursory kind of flick through statistics for that one. But you're talking around the same kind of levels of like a, a Barrichello or a Bottas or something like that for people who might not have won in a year when someone you know having scored so many podiums as well so very very strong less strong nick de Vries. i almost forgot that nick de Vries had raced this year when i was putting together all the all the data for this and kind of all the all the graphics as well it seems so long ago that nick de Vries was in that alpha towery and i think it just didn't happen for him and i think he was almost in a way 
unfortunate that he had gone so well at Monza the previous year, almost flattered to, to, to deceive in a way on his potential and how good he could be. He wasn't helped by the fact that, that Alpha Tari was not good at all at the beginning part of the year, but looking at what Ricardo achieved, specifically kind of honing on, on Mexico here, I don't see De Vries performing anywhere close to that kind of standard. So harsh as it was, it was kind of a justified sacking. So he was just kind of invisible the whole the whole year, just on track, off track as well. He wasn't doing any media appearances or interviews, but on track, he didn't score any points. He was mostly getting eliminated Q1 and was generally being outperformed by Sunoda. But again, he was there at a time in the beginning of the season when it wasn't particularly strong, but there was still quite a significant gap on, on race pace. It kind of flattered people a bit because he, he's a bit of a village bicycle in that like last year he drove for Williams, Mercedes and Aston Martin. And then he goes into Alpha Tauri, having never been a Red Bull junior. And I think this might make him the first ever Toro Rosso slash Alpha Tauri driver that was never a Red Bull junior. Oh, uh, no, you had um, Sebastian Bourdais. Yes, okay, Bourdais. Other than, yes, Bourdais, who, who again flopped quite hard. Um, but otherwise, they were all Red Bull juniors before going to that, that team. And they probably brought him in because they were thinking experience, because you forget... Even though he looks about 10 years old, he's mm-hmm. like 28. Yeah. And he's got a Formula E title. He's got a Formula 2 title, although he was on one of the least competitive Formula 2 grids we've ever seen. I mean, he fit, the runner-up was Nicholas Latifi, which speaks volumes. Yeah, that's all you need to say. <laughs> yeah. But again, the Italy race, it looked so good because he basically bodied Latifi by finishing ninth in that car when Latifi was outside the points or whatever. Mm-hmm. Just be yeah, just just not good. I mean, they could have been a bit more merciful by at least waiting until the summer break to let him go, to let him run in Hungary and Belgium, and then do it over the summer break rather than just cutting him off very abruptly like that to then bring Ricardo in. Especially because then two races later, Ricardo has to go anyway, and then they have to bring in Lawson. But yeah, not not a good not a good year for him. He's going back to Formula E. I don't think we're going to be seeing him in Formula One again in the future. No, I think that's that's the last of of De Vries that we're going to see. I mean, in many ways, he was. We we spoke earlier on about sort of musical chairs having to line up perfectly to get a seat, and that's almost kind of what it was for De Vries in a way. In that, you know, rightly or wrongly, they didn't feel that any of the juniors were ready for that role. They tried to get hold of Colton Herter, couldn't get him, and so amongst all that kind of shuffling, he he somehow ended up in there. I mean, there's, there's that great meme where it's you know you've got there's those dominoes kind of lined up, and it's got Alex Albon's appendix bursting, and it just kind of skitters down to, you know, Daniel Ricciardo mm. getting a 2025 Red Bull drive or something like that. Yeah, he was lucky to get opportunity, but just unfortunate that he, he just couldn't do anything with it. Whether he can do something here is potentially interesting. We said that this was one of McLaren's weaker tracks. This was a decent one, though, for Alpha Tauri. You know, they were 11th and 12th in qualifying. Lawson was just outside of the points at the end of the race as well. Plus, we have the factor of that De Vries does have previous for kind of going strongly in Monza as well. As of all the circuits to kind of jump into and get racing on, it's probably one of the easiest ones to handle. So does his kind of mediocrity of the year get outweighed by the fact that AlphaTauri can potentially be good here and McLaren might struggle a bit more? Yeah, this is what makes it closer than it should be, really, is that it was a bad race for McLaren. And a modestly good one for Avatar, even though Sonoda never even got to start the race. He's experienced, but not experienced in Formula One. I think it still leans towards Lando. I think the car was still stronger, even if not by much. And Lando has the experience as well. My first instinct would be to make it a 5-2 for for Lando. I, I would agree. I think this is, of the 22 possible circuits we could have had, this is the one where I can look at and say, actually, Nick de Vries is a bit closer to McLaren and to Lando Norris. I think anywhere else, this is a, you know, a comfortable Norris curb stomping. But here, yeah, I've, I feel like just the drop back from McLaren and the better runs from the Afataris and the fact that de Vries knows this circuit as well just gives him a point more of an edge. Mm. Okay, so one to five for Lando Norris, or six or a seven for Nick de Vries. It's a one, Lando Norris. In many ways, good. I don't know how we could have worked out or justified Nick de Vries progressing or even winning this competition, but we don't have to worry about that anymore. On to match number seven, and we have our first all-Friday practice lineup. 
as Jake Dennis in the Red Bull takes on Pato O'Ward in the McLaren. And even more tastily, this is taking place on the streets of Las Vegas. Not so much time we really need to spend on both drivers here. I mean, it's on paper, it's a really interesting duel. You've got the Formula E champion against an IndyCar star racing out on a circuit that neither of them have ever been on. Touching on Jake Dennis briefly first, safe to say it was an unexpected opportunity to get that debut with Red Bull more because they couldn't use Lawson for the remainder of the year. So, you know, welcome to see someone a little bit different out there, but we can all accept that there's there's no prospect of, of, of Dennis making it into Formula One in the future. I think he's just signed a longer term contract in Formula E, but, you know, he was 16th in practice, just slightly faster than Isaac Hajar, which take from that what you will. What's interesting with this is, though, is that we have the first opportunity where they're both Friday practice drivers, but they both competed in the same session. And he was just marginally slower than O'Ward in this one as well. Yeah, this is a very interesting one because then both non-F1 drivers who've had relatively little experience driving in Formula One, but also they drive in two very, very different series normally. So obviously, Dennis, he incumbent Formula E champion the year before that he almost won it but there was that really chaotic race at um, Berlin Airfield track when he got knocked out at the start Pato in Indy again is a it's hard to say with him because he I watch Formula E and IndyCar sort of part-time I'll tune in when I can although next year that's going to be difficult now that we've seen that Formula E is going behind a paywall Pato is a very aggressive driver. He's won a few races, but there are a lot of races he would have, should have won that just didn't because he's crashed or had problems. I mean, one example was the Indy 500 this year. Like, he crashed out fighting for the lead when a lot of people thought he could win it. And he has more FP1 experience. I mean, his first, his first ever time, I think it was last year or the year before, Abu Dhabi, and the, the car broke down as soon as he left the pit lane. <laughs> and that was this session done. And he's gunning for Formula One, but he's a he's a McLaren reserve. But there's no there's again there's no room at the inn for him with Lando and and Piastri there and all the other juniors and everyone else who are more aligned for Formula One. He's probably going to end up staying in IndyCar. Jake, I just don't I don't know him so well. This circuit is quite interesting because it has it, it could pass as an Indy circuit and as a Formula E circuit. Maybe it was half the length because Formula E cars would be going at a snail's pace down that 1.7 mile back straight but otherwise a narrow bumpy street circuit with 90 degree turns it does it reeks of formula e and it reeks of indy car so they probably both feel quite at home driving around here even if obviously not in formula e against indy car but yeah dennis is in the red bull that's the thing so i feel like it goes on the basis of that how much better that car was it leans towards him and also because O'Ward is someone you can you can trust to to crash at the start or but it's a close one. It's a it's definitely a close one. I think it's definitely four and three. See, in my mind, it slides it towards a ward simply because he's had more time in a Formula One car. And I suppose IndyCar cars are more similar to a Formula One car in that they're faster, they're not electric, they're more aero dependent than a Formula because a Formula E car they don't even have gears or a clutch. It's just a it's a glorified electric go kart basically. And not nearly as fast. So, <laughs> yeah, the IndyCar experience is more analogous to the Formula One experience, even if in practice they do feel very different. But yeah, that helps him too. It is just tricky, though. Jake Dennis is not someone I've ever given a huge amount of attention to, but they're trying to trying to work out form in Formula E is dif- is impossible because it is so desperately inconsistent. Yeah, there's no way of kind of putting producing any kind of form book for that kind of racing series because it's just so chaotic. Yeah, I mean, whoever is the, whoever is the champion, they're not the best driver; they're just the least worst. <laughs> is how how I'd put it. It's yeah, yeah. Whoever makes the fewest mistakes is the winner. So yeah, putting together odds for this, uh, the only points of data I have is that Award's done more practice sessions, and also when they tested alongside one another during Abu Dhabi, Award was faster, albeit by 0.1 seconds. It's whether we think. That advantage that that Red Bull is going to have over the McLaren is enough to counteract the experience that O'Ward has compared to Dennis. Yeah, I think, I mean, looking at the results again for the the cars, the McLaren, it was 10th and a retirement for Lando, Vegas, and then first and third for um, Red Bull. So even though it was very close with Ferrari, the car was good enough there that even Sergio Perez was doing well. (laughs) I think so. I think there is quite a serious car advantage for Jake Dennis. 
Yeah. All right. I will I will buy into that and I will, will say a four three in favour of Dennis. So one to four for Jake Dennis, five, six or seven for Pato Award. And it is a five. We get our first upsets. Ooh. And Pato Award goes through. We reach the halfway point of the first round and we're on to match eight, which is Esteban Ocon against Teo Porcher. And this is taking place in Catalonia, Spain. I mean with a match like this, anyway, you can more or less copy and paste what we said about Pierre Gasly and just insert Esteban Ocon's name and said, just albeit with quite a few more incidents and retirements attached to that as well. A pretty, again, steady year. Again, it was, it was a good way that you put it earlier. I think you can say the same with Ocon as well. The exception being that there was just perhaps a few too many incidents, whether his fault or not, to really call it a particularly good one. Yeah, um, it is just Ocon. It's just Gasly with more crashes pretty much and just more more shit stirring i think this is when things were closer because again when you look at paul chair and alfa romeo it was a stronger race for them because this is where joe got points Mm -hmm. and alpine finished eighth and tenth and there was a yeah he was in night so the the race space is actually very very similar here but then paul chair okay he he won the f2 title this year god knows how to be honest because he had an amazing start and then he had the complete stinker in Jeddah and then he won one race in Bahrain and then just the rest of the year was vaguely consistent and that was enough for him to take the title even though again he was useless at the final round but had such an advantage he didn't need to do much to take the title and he is now looking to be going to super formula because your reward for winning formula two is to not go anywhere near formula one yeah (laughs) it's just that lack of experience again everyone rates him as a generational talent it's like i think if anything he's damaged his reputation this year even if he won the title because it was just so average and it was just a year of such such desperate inconsistency from everybody so that lack of experience is not going to help him here against somebody like ocon porsche has been good but he's not been great and he's certainly not kicking down the doors and saying, oh, everyone, you must, you must sign Teo Porsche, you know, in much the way that, you know, when Oscar Piastri or George Russell came through, you know, it was, oh, these guys have got to get it tough and we've got to make sure we find them a seat. Whereas Porsche, less of that. It, it would have been nice if he'd gone in at Alfa Romeo. I think there was potential for a slot there. Maybe there will be in 2025. It's difficult to say, whereas sort of with some of these other Friday practice drivers, we've kind of said, oh, they've, they've looked a bit stronger or, you know, they've had the potential. I mean, when Porsche did his practice times this year, he didn't really get a chance to do one in Mexico because there were problems with the car. In Abu Dhabi, he was 14th. Again, this is with our myriad of junior drivers is going on as well. And he was 0.7 seconds slower than Bottas, who was, you know, far from having a particularly brilliant year himself. So if we assume that he's going to be operating not at that kind of same level. If we're putting Alpine and Alfa Romeo around the same kind of level in Spain, you can drop Porsche a little bit below that if we consider that that kind of practice pace is indicative of how well he'll perform. Again, that's the only kind of data point we have, so it's all we can kind of assume. I think it's I think it's definitely in favour of Ocon, and I'm I'm almost inclined in a way to put it as as six and one, which seems harsh when it's you know the reigning F2 champion against someone who's had a middling to steady year, but. I've not seen anything from Porsche in these kind of practice appearances that suggest that he's going to get out there and immediately, you know, take that car by the scruff of the net and ring it round and, you know, surprise everyone. I'm leaning to a 5-2 on the basis that um, this is one of the few races where those two teams were actually quite close on pace because we saw Joe, of all people, finishing in between both drivers in the race. So on that basis, I think it's not so quite so one-sided. Yeah, I think that's fair, actually. I think if this was clearly a race where Alfa Romeo struggled or Porsche hadn't been before, that would probably be cause for a 6-1. and one. But I think if they're quite well matched, Porsche has been here and has a fairly average record in sort of racing in the junior categories in Spain as well. Yeah, I think I'd be happy with a 5-2 and two on this one. So, 1-5 to five for Esteban Ocon, a 6 or a 7 for Teo Porsche. It is a 4, Esteban Ocon will move on through. Match nine, and we get our first, I guess, kind of inter-team battle. Two Haases. In this case, we have Nico Hulkenberg against Oli Bearman, and this is taking place at Mexico City. We'll start with Hulkenberg. A pretty solid year. We touched on it a little bit earlier when we spoke about Magnussen. Of the two Haas drivers, he was probably the better, but 
it's not say a huge amount considering how often you know the Haases did struggle, but more often than not, we saw a lot more of Hulkenberg. He was, I think, more regularly than than Magnus said into Q3, qualified as high as P2 before for penalties this year as well. So we saw a lot of potential during sort of Saturdays and qualifying sessions. It was just Sunday, unfortunately, the car let him down a bit more. Yeah. It seems to be the case that he he could qualify really well. I mean, even in the very last race, he qualified seventh and was outside of the points before they even got to turn one. There was the occasional race where they could make the ties last or things worked in their favour, but otherwise it was just being let down by the car just not being very good. But I think, yeah, as as the first equal machinery battle, I think it falls pretty much entirely in his favour on the basis of experience. To be going up against like an 18-year-old rookie who's never driven in Formula 1, I can't really see it going Behrman's way. I agree that it's in favour of Hulkenberg, but I think this is a lot closer than you would anticipate. Behrman was, he had a very good year in F2, but also his Friday practice appearances were very good as well. Three tenths of Hulkenberg when they were in Mexico, which is obviously where we are now. So we have almost kind of the perfect data point for comparing their pace. But he was also 10th shy of Magnussen and Abu Dhabi as well. So of all those drivers who have jumped in to do these Friday practice appearances, Behrman has arguably done some of the better work. And of all of them as well, he's probably one of the ones where we're more likely to have a conversation about whether he's going to make it into Formula One. And on this basis, I feel like he, he will. It's just a question of where. Well, obviously, Haas is locked out for the next year, and that's the obvious thing because he's a Ferrari junior and they're a sort of, well, unofficial Ferrari B team. They like to pretend they're American, but they're basically a, a hybrid British-Italian outfit. So, yeah, he, I mean, his Formula 2, because everyone got really excited because I think it was in Baku, he won both races. But then he was just very middling it for the rest of the year because we thought, oh, he'll win the title. And then he finished like fifth or sixth and just came nowhere near it. Mm. And everyone keeps saying, oh, he's a, he's a generational talent like like Kimi Antonelli. And it's like, well, we didn't really see it that much this year when he should have really comfortably won the title, particularly how, with how inconsistent everybody else was. I think it is just that lack of experience and also youth because he's only 18 that just doesn't really work in his favour. I think that's fair. Um, I think I've, I've just really tried to, to throw in as many upsets as possible potentially as well. So not as close as maybe I had it in my mind. Would 5-2 be fair for Hulkenberg, or would you say that Hulkenberg's got more of an advantage? I think he has more. I'm leaning on a 6-1. Yeah, I think I'm happy to go with that as yeah. well. I think I'm wishing and hoping that it would be closer than it is, but you can't ignore the experience of Hulkenberg. They may have been closer during those Friday practices, but we don't know what that means. We don't know if that was on a lower fuel run. We don't know who was running what simulations. So it's not hugely yeah. promising, but... The one point we have is that Hulkenberg was faster during that practice session. You can assume he's going to be better in the race and he's going to have that more experience of kind of wily racecraft and defending and attacking and knowing kind of how to hustle that car. And he's got a good record in Mexico as well. So Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I'm happy to go for six and one. So a seven for Oli Behrman and all the other numbers for Nico Hulkenberg. It is a two. So we move on to match 10. This may be a shorter debate that we'll have to have as we see Jack Doohan and his Alpine taking on Lewis Hamilton at the Hungaro ring. I mean, we'll touch on Jack Doohan first. It seems to fit in kind of that slot of we need a, a junior driver who hasn't raced in Formula 1 to drive in free practice, so we'll have you. Pretty all right in F2 this year. He's not returning there next year, so he's going to that school of let's stand in the background of a, a pit garage all year, see put ourselves in lots of TV shots with headphones on and see if that turns into a Formula One drive, which, yeah, I can't see happening. Of, of all the outfits, Alpine seems the least likely to get any of its juniors through to, to Formula One. Yeah, you, you need to be clear and present if you want to be getting people's attention and getting seats and spending a whole year doing nothing is not going to do that, even if he's in the garage and maybe doing simulator work and may, maybe one FP1 session. If it was something like, for example, 2012, Bottas did 15 FP1 sessions. If it was something like that, it's like, okay, they're obviously grooming him for one of the seats. But if they're just going to give him one FP1, it's like, oh, well, you're here because we're contractually obliged to have put you in the seat. I mean, he should still be doing another year in F2. I don't think anyone should be staying in F2 for more than two seasons, ideally. But if it's fully funded by Alpine, why not? If the other option is to do absolutely nothing. 
But he's not someone you can really picture being an F1. We've we've already got one really talented Aussie in Oscar Piastri. Like we, he's not going to be blowing people away. Least of all Lewis Hamilton. No. Let's be honest. Yeah, like I say, least of all Hamilton, and least of all here at the Hungara Ring as well. This is absolutely one of Hamilton's best circuits. It was one of his better races this year as well. It was his only pole. And though he only kind of finished fourth, he was only behind kind of the Red Bulls and Norris, who were clearly ahead in terms of pace. Mm. Um, and he was comfortably kind of ahead of the chasing pack as well. So as we saw kind of all year from Hamilton, he just kind of kept extracting the maximum he could out of that Mercedes. It was a, another strong year from Hamilton, as, as you know, we should always be expecting. Yeah, even if he was fourth by the end of the first turn, it's not. You can always depend on him to deliver if the car will let him. It's, it's such a one-sided thing about having a seven-time champion against someone who's never driven in Formula One and is only average in feeder formula. We don't even need to say the numbers that we're comfortably in agreement. This is this is six and yeah. one in favour of Hamilton. So a one will do it for Jack Doohan and everything else for Lewis Hamilton. And it's a three. Lewis Hamilton marches through. Next up, we continue our attempts to sort of have every Friday practice driver go up against a very experienced foe. And we have Valtteri Bottas against Zach O'Sullivan in his Williams. This is taking place at Spa, Bracachon. Valtteri Bottas was around this year. Of all the drivers on the grid, he was one of them. He, he was the most one of them of, the, of, the, yeah. of all the drivers. <laughs> yeah, I think... Personally speaking, I think he's lucky that he has a multi-year contract there, or I think there would have been a more serious consideration to put Porsche in that seat, potentially. I think Joe had the better of him in most of the year as well. There were the occasional flashes of Bottas being good, where he could sort of wrangle the car up into the points, and that was fine, but it was few and far between, really. So it was just a very middling year. And you wonder what he wants to do with this kind of opportunity, because... Drivers that move back from these kind of race winning operations to somewhere in the midfield have accepted, right, that was my time at the front kind of done. Let's shuffle back just so we can be in Formula One. But is is he enjoying what he's doing? Because surely that's the only reason you would stick around for what you want to do is for the love of racing in Formula One. But it feels like he's not getting to do that because he's stuck wasting around in the midfield. Is he just trying to hold on to that seat for as long as possible in the hopes that he can be there when Audi comes in? Or what's his plan? Well, you wonder if he's ever enjoyed himself, because even when he was in competitive machinery, he was still invisible. He just doesn't have any race craft. That's the problem. I mean, they, they, this is a retirement home. I mean, that's what Alfa Romeo is. It was for Kimi. And it's the same when Barrichello went to Williams or Patrese going to Benetton, that sort of thing. It's just like you've, you've had your chance at the top and now it's time to, you know, just do nothing for three years and then give up. Just just so invisible. It's just this total absence of race craft. Again, his race starts are also really bad. It's something where it is as one-sided as the last one, but only because you have to shift both drivers down. Because Bottas is, is in many ways, is the inverse of Lewis, especially on a Saturday, or su a Sunday even. But then O'Sullivan, he's only in Formula 3. He's won a few races, but otherwise it's like, okay, you are you exist and you're doing some stuff. But Yeah, he was very good in Formula 3 this year. I think he was um, the title runner-up at the end of it. Mm. But... The gap to jump from F3 to F4 is obviously quite a big one. He did reasonably well in Abu Dhabi. He was 0.7 seconds from Sargent, which take from that, you know, what you will, regardless of how good you think Sargent is and how easy it is to jump into the F3 practice. But I think you're right. I think this is still an overwhelming majority in favour of that more experienced person. Like I say, they both take a step down, but even in just a mediocre average car, Bottas is still comfortably better than a guy who has never raced in Formula 1. He's probably as far away from Formula 1 as anyone else that we're going to discuss today. You know, it's not even if so we have a circuit where Williams were particularly strong at. They This was one of their their weak ones of the year. So, yeah, comfortable Bottas 6-1 for me. Yeah, what lies in that one is Bottas having a useless start, basically. So, a 7 for Zach O'Sullivan and all the other numbers for Valtteri Bottas. And it is a 3. Valtteri Bottas will march on through. We finish up this little segment of main season drivers taking on Friday practice appearances. We take, see Robert Schwartzman uh, take on Liam Lawson on the streets of Monte Carlo. We'll touch on Schwartzman. He very much kind of fits that same kind of role that Doohan is doing at Alpine, but for Ferrari instead. 
you know, he's there to do those mandated practice appearances and move on with that, really. I don't see a serious sign that he's going to, you know, be given an opportunity in Formula 1, especially since he's not racing any sort of the junior uh, formula anymore. Yeah, he's a puzzling one because he he kind of hangs around with Ferrari. I mean, again, he sits in the garage with the headphones on. He'll do the photo ops when they launch the car. He'll, he'll stand and pose with it, even though he never drives it. And he was quite good in Formula 2 because he was runner-up in 21. But then basically he got his career was killed because of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. That just put an end to things for him. With these two, even though Lawson has F1 experience, I think you can kind of compare them more closely as F2 drivers. Although yeah. I don't know if they... They only had one season. It was only 21 where they were racing against each other. And they both won races, but Schwartz, Schwartzman was runner-up and Lawson was ninth um, in that time. But then you look at the cars they got. If you're going to compare the Ferrari to the Alpha Tauri at Monaco, the Ferrari is obviously the better car mm-hmm. um, by quite a margin. So that's why this is, for me, is it leans quite heavily for Schwartzman. I mean, I'm, although he himself, only, I feel like he's one of these ones you feel like he's been around for forever, but then he only did two years in Formula 2 as well. Mm-hmm. And he also he won Formula 3. We forget that. Um, but Monaco, he did... Well, they didn't race there in 2020, and then he was retired and 10th in 21. But then Liam Lawson got disqualified and was 7th in 21, and then 8th and retired in 22. So it's not really a strong circuit for either of them. Well, Liam Lawson actually won that race he was disqualified from. So oh, right, okay. He does have precedent for being stronger uh, of, of the two on, on these circuits. We'll, we'll touch on Liam Lawson now. Very, very good performance. In, in the sort of the short time we saw him, obviously raised a lot of questions of why he wasn't even in that seat to begin with, and arguably has raised further questions of why he's not going to be in that seat for 2024. But, you know, it, in this era where a lot of people say it's hard to judge what rookies are doing because there's so little time they get before the season to kind of bed in and do their testing, you know, some will argue that just doing that maiden year is almost just kind of like a prolonged testing session for them just to get up to speed and then we'll see more in, in sort of that second year. I mean, that's a lot, a lot of people argue about someone like Logan Sargent. But then conversely, you get performances from Oscar Priestry and from Liam Lawson as well, who are in that same position experience-wise, yet are able to extract more performance than, you know, the likes of a Sargent are doing. Yeah, I think it's just Lawson, he's disadvantaged here because the, the Ferrari is so much better because they finished, um, what, sixth and eighth Ferrari did, and then it was 12th and 14th for Alpha Tauri. So this was at a point in the season when the Ferrari... Well, the Ferrari is always strong, but the Alfa Tauri was still quite weak. And it's a circuit where overtaking is not easy. So it's kind of down to whoever gets the better start, I suppose. The crucial thing here is that is the circuit we're on. It's like you say, whoever's getting that start at the beginning and it stays in front is likely to stay in front all the way. We, we may potentially see a more kind of opportunistic overtake going in that, that, like that third lap or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I think... Again, another one I've maybe th- I've thought about this one but beforehand. I don't, initially, I wanted to give it in favour to Lawson, but I think you're right. I think because of that advantage of the car, and also Schwartzman was pretty decent in the car as well. He was only 300 off the pace of signs in Abu Dhabi. So he, he can extract a decent lap time from it as well. So if we can assume that he's going to match that kind of pace, call off out front and stay out front, he, he comfortably gets the win. The difference being that... It's, it's funny, isn't it? We're going to give... Uh, saying we're going to give the advantage to Schwartzman. I think Lawson is, is the better driver. He's just unfortunate that he's in the worst machinery at a circuit where overtaking is going to be really, really tricky. I mean, if you look at the two, yeah, I think it does just, I think it would just fall, fall into Schwartzman. Um, you could make it, it's not obvious, so obviously one-sided, but I think it would be a, a 5-2 for Schwartzman for me. Yeah, I'd be happy to go with that one. So six or a seven for Liam Lawson. Or a one to five for Robert Schwartzman. And it's a three. Robert Schwartzman will move on. So match 13, and we get George Russell against Logan Sargent at Zandvoort. An interesting year for, for George Russell. I, I don't know how I did. I'm trying to think of ways to ways to describe it. I mean, from your perspective, how was it for a year for George Russell? Good, but not as good as last year, basically. He would have some races where he was comfortably beating Lewis, but then a lot where he wasn't. 
So it was definitely inconsistent. And he would, he had, he seemed to have sort of delusions of grandeur because he would crash into somebody and they go, oh, where's my podium? And that. <laughs> and, and yeah, he crashed out at the end of Singapore and that as well. But he would have a lot of races where he was very strong as well. But it, it wasn't the same as 22, where it was like so, so consistently beating Lewis and everyone, that was kind of getting people's attention. I feel like the pizzazz has kind of gone from when he was a, a Williams driver and everyone was like, get him in that seat instead of Bottas. And everyone was just absolutely blown away by what he did in Sakir in 2020 and, and, and things like that. It's just that, that we, we've kind of lost that. And now he's just kind of got, well, he's got stuck in the way that Leclerc and all the others have got stuck is that it's just waiting for Max to retire, also not have the best car anymore. And just otherwise settling for finishing, you know, third, fourth, fifth in that in the meantime. I agree. He's definitely lost a lot of that kind of wow factor head about him. And it, it pains me to say it because, again, this was someone that extracted so many good performances out of Williams. But he's really become a bit of a whinger during races. The amount of times we hear him on the team radio going, oh, are we, are we going to let him pass? What are we doing? What's happening with this? You know, he seems to be constantly on the blower to try and find a way past Hamilton rather than... I don't know, doing some overtaking or, or something like that. I know it's easier said than done, but yeah, I, I wonder if almost in a way some of us and he in particular were lulled into a false sense of security about last year, because I think whilst he had the number of Hamilton, you've got to remember that Hamilton was effectively a testing mule for a lot of last year. You know, he was trying to find ways to fix that Mercedes package. So naturally he would be further back as they kind of figured things out and George could kind of just get on with with what he was doing yeah george sort of seems more adaptable because lewis had more consistent good races this year but then there were races where the car just wasn't working for him but it would work for george and hamilton just had no answer and he just couldn't even work out how to fix it but george he was overthinking things a lot because he was always yeah like you said he was always on the radio he was always working out you know are we doing team orders am i letting him through are we doing this who's pitting when and, and all of this stuff and again, similar to similar to, to Carlos in that sense, he's he's thinking about the other drivers and what they're trying to do and thinking about their strategies and that. There was one of the more recent races. I can't remember which one it was. It was just funny. He went kind of full chav because on the radio he was just like, "Oh mate, these tires are well bad." <laughs> or something. Um, like he he still like he hasn't quite got out of his like terrorist phase of just crashing into people and then wondering why he didn't finish on the podium. Yeah, still far too many errors and there's there's a good reason that people are sort of questioning that kind of wheel to wheel skills that he's got because yeah how often does it end with with bumping into someone else or or, or like a singapore where he just goes into the wall luckily for him he's against logan Sargent, which uh, i don't know where to begin with my feelings on on logan Sargent. i felt it was a good good signing at the beginning of the year i thought it was better than having latifi around for another year i think as the year's gone on you know we, we spoke before about whether you know the rookies can kind of get a chance and what how the, the fairest way we can judge and, and and treat rookies now i think the problem for logan was there's not really any kind of standout moments where you kind of look back and say oh yes this is yeah he's he's figured it out now he knows what he's doing in formula one you know whereas converse you know we had so many good moments for for piastri and and, and for lawson as well there were some decent qualifying performances from Sargent, but it inevitably turned to nothing. And, you know, he scored a point, but in, you know, effectively the same way that Sergei Sorotkin scored points for Williams, you know, relying on other kind of disqualifications to bump him up the order. Mm. There was improvement as the year went on. And I think he's very lucky that Williams did not have a better candidate for that role for next year. I think... If you look around for who was being mooted for that role, whether it was Vesti or Felipe Drogovic or someone like that, you're replacing a rookie with a rookie, which, you know, there's no guarantee that that's going to produce any more results than what Logan was already producing. So, you know, it makes more sense for them to stick rather than, than, than twist in that situation. We'll see, you know, if next year he does make the step up, fantastic. But if he doesn't, then he doesn't have any more excuses to kind of hide behind. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, Williams have kind of given a good model of driver management in that they've been very supportive and they've they realised, you know, that doing what Red Bull's camp commandant does of just punching them when they're down is not going to work. Mm -hmm. And so they've been kind of, you know, sympathetic to him and said, oh yeah, we we he is he is improving slowly. And I mean, okay, yes, he's crashing and that's costing us a lot of money and development time, but you know, we have to try and still be supportive of him. 
and he was just lucky that there was nobody else in the in the the, the woodwork because even from Williams Juniors directly, like it's Franco Colapinto and Zach O'Sullivan are the two most senior ones, and they're only just moving up to Formula Two. Yeah, so they're not ready. If Colapinto was in Formula Two this year, I think he probably would have got that seat instead. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's just too far behind. And then Vesti was a candidate, but again, th- but if it wasn't Vesti, they would have put um, Mick in more likely because Toto kept trying to push to give the seat to Mick, which James Fowles didn't want because he seems to want to try to distance Williams from Mercedes. And Drogovic, there isn't a seat Drogovic won't turn down. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, he, again, the moment has gone. He won F2 and then his reward is absolutely nothing. And again, he's not getting a seat with Aston Martin anytime soon in their current form. So he may as well just cut his losses and go to Formula E. So he, yeah, he just he he just got lucky. There is competition for seats, but not for that seat. That's the thing. It's the least desirable seat on the grid, and so he's he can stick that out for another year. But in terms of his year, yeah, n- never once out qualified Alvon. There was a few races where they were close, such as well the first half of Vegas. Zandvoort could have been good, even though he crashed in F in, in Q3. But then he they messed up his strategy at the start, and then he crashed. But that crash wasn't his fault. Mm-hmm. So there was potential, but otherwise he was just completely average. Considering he'd been relatively decent in the feeder formula, and was very unlucky to lose the, t- the F3 title to Piastri. In a matchup like this, he's got no leg to stand on against Russell in a Mercedes. No, there's there's no real justification. I, I think this is the, the advantage of. Mercedes to Williams and the advantage that Russell hides over Sargent. Yeah, it's comfortably in favour of, of George. I mean, are we going to call it a six and one? I think so, yeah. Even if this is one of their, somehow this was a strong Williams circuit and they didn't even understand why. It was also a strong Mercedes circuit. All right, we'll go for that then. So a seven for Logan Sargent and everything else for George Russell. And that is a three. George Russell moves forward. My dreams of a Williams win disappear. Just spoke about him, and now here he is again. It's Felipe Drogovic in his Aston Martin, and he's against Yuki Sonoda at Albert Park. We did just touch on it, I think. Yeah, Drogovic, little to no chance really of making it into Formula 1, despite his best efforts to cram himself into a driver, Alfa Romeo or Williams or, or anywhere else. You know, in many ways, we were kind of unfortunate to just miss out on seeing him this year, given he, he tested at the beginning of the year when Lance Stroll was injured. We, we narrowly kind of avoided getting to actually see him in a racing position, but instead, yeah, just subjected to a year on the sidelines, a few free practice appearances. I mean, the final one, very impressive. He was second in Abu Dhabi, faster than Stroll, and just 0.2 seconds um, of beating George Russell there. But apart from that, there's not a lot to, to discuss, really, with Djokovic. You know, he's not raced in Australia, and also he hasn't raced for a year. So that's, I think that's got to come into consideration here. Mm. I rated him fairly highly in Formula 2 because he would, when he was at like MP Motorsport and some of the smaller teams, he would have these occasional races where he would just annihilate everyone and then he would just exist for the rest of the year. And eventually he managed to get, he gets himself a title, even though he was never a part of any junior academies. And then he just got this Aston Martin one by default. Not that they really have a driver academy, they just created it for him, I think. But this is the beginning of the season. This is when Aston Martin was still strong and Alpha Tari was still weak. That, that leans heavily in his favour, considering, again, his opponent is Tsunoda, who, even though he has matured and improved, he's in a weak car in this, and he's still very reckless, even now. So he's, he's one you can rely on more to make mistakes. Yeah, it's, it's almost a carbon copy in a way of when we had Schwartzman against Liam Lawson. You know, I think Tsunoda is the better driver. I think he's had a, a fantastic year kind of wrangling that Alpha Tari farther than it should do. And I think that's something to put into consideration as well, as that even at the beginning of this year, when the Aston Martin was head and shoulders above it, Sonoda was still kind of probably overachieving with the machinery he had underneath him as well. But like you say, you know, Aston were very strong here in Australia. I think they were third and fourth, whereas Alfa Tari squeaked into the points mostly through the, the chaos that we had after kind of the restart as well. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about Sonoda quickly. I mean, like I said, I, I was particularly impressed with him this year what was what was your sort of feeling i was too i mean he did have a few stinkers but at the beginning of the season what surprised me was the maturity because he was it was very one-sided against de and he was taking on a leadership role because he was he was trying to take the reins of strategy and pushing the team like why are we doing this we should be doing this and this this is not good enough we need to do better and you can see he was working overtime in a car that was just awful. And it was taking everything he had just to get it into 10th place. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, very good final race. I mean, I think squandered by strategy. If they'd gone for a more aggressive... If, if for once, 
a team had just decided to go aggressive, maybe he could have finished fourth or fifth or possibly third. But there's like, no, no, let's just do a very safe one stop and hope he can make the tyres last. So he has improved. And I think, I think he warranted staying in the Alpha Tauri next year, particularly because I just can't be asked of Daniel Ricciardo anymore. So I think it should have been him and Lawson. <laughs> he, he's not a generational talent, but he's like, maybe one day he'll get a podium. He's kind of sort of on the, not, not, not really on the level of Sato Kobayashi, more, more of an Aguri Suzuki, I think. Maybe he'll get a podium one day, but that's pretty much it. Yeah, just confirming what we've said already. A, a very strong year for him. I think every time I've done a season review before, I've ranked him pretty much towards the bottom because he's either made too many mistakes or underwhelmed in a way compared to what he, we thought he could do. This year, yeah, comfortably in the discussion for sort of one of the drivers of the year for what he's, he's wrangled out of that Alpha Tauri. The problem for him here is that he's having to wrangle it against a very kind of competitive car. And not just that, but someone who has proven that they can get into that car and produce a good lap time out of it as well. So it's where we stand on thinking how, how close this one might be. I don't think it's going to be that close is the thing. Because again, at the beginning of the year, Drogovic, he did pre-season testing for them when Stroll broke his wrists. It was funny that he was caught liking tweets in Portuguese, basically bitching about Stroll and saying, why are they putting him in? He's, he's still, he hasn't healed. You know, Drogovic did all the work in pre-season testing. Let's give him the seat. He quickly unlikes those when people notice it. <laughs> because it's early in the season, it's, it's, it's not that close to me. That's fair. Are we thinking 6-1 or 5-2? Uh, I think a 6-1. Yeah, I think that's fair. And again, it's... Not indicative of which driver is better than the other, but at this point in time, who's got the better machinery? Who's more likely to produce something out of it? And I think even with all his wrangling, I don't think Yuki Tsunoda could convince that that Alpha Tower to get above an Aston Martin, certainly not at this point in the season, certainly not in the hands of someone who was pretty tuned in at this point and, yeah, we, we, we know can drag a lap time out of it. Yeah. So a seven for Yuki Tsunoda and everything else for Felipe Drogovic. And it's a two. Drogovic will move on. Okay, so our penultimate matchup in the first round, we have Isaac Hadjar in the Alpha Tauri, and he's up against Charles Leclerc at Cota. Another matchup where I think it's pretty much cut and dry. I suppose the only caveat I maybe want to put around with it is we're adding in these dice rolls to kind of factor in driver errors, things, you know, things that may go wrong and all that other sort of things as well. Can we argue that it's impossible for Charles Leclerc to have anything above a five and two? Because inevitably something will go wrong for him. His race starts are usually not bad. It's just things going wrong. M mostly if things go wrong, it's usually later in the races. He doesn't often have things going completely wrong at the beginning. Again, he's extremely aggressive. How aggressive he would feel he'd need to be against the likes of Isaac Hadjar in a much worse car, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is a matchup where Hadjar is probably more likely to make mistakes. Because again, he... I don't really rate him. He's one of these ones where I, I don't even understand why they gave him an FB1 seat you'd think Dennis I mean now that he's left too but Dennis Hauger would have been an obvious choice from the Red Bull junior team over Isaac Hadyar he just kind of exists in F2 it was a really kind of strange choice especially when you consider how well you know Ayuba Uwasa was doing this year as well you wonder whether it was in part they were thinking oh well let's not distract Uwasa from what he's doing let him kind of concentrate on having his title tilt and let someone else worry about a distraction like this but yeah, it was it was an an odd choice for someone to be getting their free practice appearances, not just for that Alpha Tauri, but at Red Bull as well. And didn't particularly see anything that you know immediately kind of suggested that he was you know here's a diamond in the rough that you know we might have missed otherwise. You know he was one point four seconds away from Ricardo in Mexico when he was in the Alpha Tauri. So there's there's not a lot to suggest that he's going to drag any kind of surprise result out of this. No. I think it's a, it's a 6-1, really. Yeah, a comfortable 6-1 for me. So yeah, a 1 for Isaac Hadjar and everything else for Charles Leclerc. And what would be more Leclerc than losing this? But he doesn't because it's a 5 and Charles Leclerc will go through. So we reach the final match and what we can categorically call an absolute thigh rubber of a matchup. Um, this, I promise this was all randomly generated. No shenanigans went on here from the FIA, the FOM, or, or myself. We get Sergio Perez against Fernando Alonso in Singapore. This is a, a really weak circuit for both of them. Yeah, of all the circuits to go for, this is really interesting because it's that rare kind of chink in Red Bull's armour this year. 
but then conversely you he's going up against Alonso who this was probably his worst race of the year made errors going across the pit line had the slow stop and then the error in the final sector late on in the race as well so Perez not perhaps as vulnerable as he might normally be in other races yeah it was the only time this year that Alonso finished outside the points the thing is historically it's a strong circuit for both because I mean we can ignore 2008 but Alonso won here in 2010 um, Mm -hmm. and then Checo won last year but for this year it was just weak because the cars were so unnaturally bad I mean the, the Red Bull ended up they salvaged fifth and eighth in the race so considering they were both knocked out in Q2 that could have been worse but Alasta Martin didn't really have a chance to get going because Stroll crashed in quality and then Alonso was making so many mistakes. And we've seen these two fighting each other a lot. Is that they're both drivers who know they're they're both like very good defensive drivers. And we've we've seen them fighting more towards the end. When again they really shouldn't have been because Perez was in such such a better car. I think this one goes to Checo because it's still, even though both cars are bad here, it's still it's the better car for him. And he has he's yeah, he just has that that advantage. Yeah, I agree. I think I think Checo gets the advantage, but it's not by that much. I think it's just four and three. I think part of what we have to consider as well is because it's Perez against Alonso, you have kind of one of these tactical masters with an arsenal full of shithousery against someone who really struggled kind of mentally this year with with pressure and or whatever you have it. And I think on this this very unique kind of one on one scenario there's a lot more scope for Perez to potentially, you know, make a mistake or for Alonso to to just do something morally ambiguous when it comes to to defence or something like that. If anyone's going to crash here, it's going to be Perez. Yeah, on the basis that Aston Martin was so, they struggled so much here, I'm happy to give it in favour of Perez, but I still think it's only a 4-3 for him. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So 1-4 to four for Sergio Perez, 5-6 or 7 for Fernando Alonso. It is a 1 Sergio Perez goes through. So we move on to the round of 16 now, and things should be a little bit more straightforward now. Now we're not covering uh, every single driver's season and their prospective years to come. Um, we jump straight in. We've got Daniel Ricciardo against Pierre Gasly in Australia. Initial thoughts is that this one goes more towards Gasly, I think. Yeah, I think so as well. Aside from the crash at the end, it was a good race for Alpine. Alpha Tarry was still weak at this point. With these two as drivers, generally, I guess you can make comparisons that they've both been at Red Bull up against Max, and it generally works out better for Ricardo than Gasly. But yeah, this swings quite heavily in Gasly's favour, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. I think this was definitely one of those weird races where Alpine were really quite strong. You know, Gasly, this was definitely one of his better races all year where he was running around that top five. Um, and it wasn't until that kind of silly clash that the, both of the Alpines had at the restart that kind of took him away from that. But other than that, he'd been a very strong all race. And I think he was even pushing Carlos Sainz at points as well. So for him, it's a good opportunity. I think, yeah, obviously Daniel Ricciardo wasn't here for, for, for this year's Australian Grand Prix. And Alvatari weren't too bad. They, they both got into Q2 for this race and Sonoda finished just outside of the points. But again, that's with all the shenanigans kind of going on at the end of the race there. So Alpine, definitely the clear favourites for that one. I'm just pondering in my mind whether it's 5-2 or 6-1. I'm going to go 6-1 on the basis of how weak the, the Alpha Tauri was. Yeah, I think that's fair. And also factor in the fact that Alpine was very strong at this particular race. Like I said, it was one of Gasly's better ones. I don't think it's unreasonable to call it 6-1 in favour of Gasly, I reckon. So... Just a one for Daniel Ricciardo and all the other numbers for Pierre Gasly. And it's a five. No upsets. Pierre Gasly moves through the quarterfinals. From one kind of mismatched operation, we move to another match as we see Lance Stroll against Max Verstappen. We're returning to Monza, Italy. You couldn't have kind of more contrasting form between these two here. This was... One of Lance Stroll's poorest weekends of the year, you know, absolutely nowhere in qualifying and then just sort of trundled around to 16th in the race. Whereas Max Verstappen, one of the few races where he wasn't on pole, but got by Carlos Sainz. Admittedly, this was one of the wins that he had to work a little bit more for and benefit from Sainz kind of outbreaking himself going into that first corner, subsequently scampered away to that, that 10th consecutive win. 
yeah, it's it's hard to look past this being another kind of slam dunk in favour of one and, and not the other. Yeah, I mean, even if Verstappen was in a worse car, he's not going to let himself get beaten by the likes of Stroll. And Stroll probably wouldn't even have the the motivation or the willingness to try to beat him. <laughs> yeah, it's only to show because actually this is a decent circuit for Lance. He's been on the podium here. He started on the front row there for a Williams as well. But we have to kind of view it through the prism of this is in this season and the way he performed with the Aston Martin there, we can only assume he's going to struggle just as much as before. It just reeks of Verstappen will be comfortably on pole and he'll break the DRS toe and just scamper away to the finish. I think it's another 6-1, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so a 1 for Lance Stroll and all the other numbers for Max Verstappen. And it's a 3. Max Verstappen is into the quarterfinals. Match three, and this is a particularly tasty one as we get an all McLaren clash. Oscar Piastri against Lando Norris. Not only that, it's in Bahrain with arguably the worst the McLaren was all year. Yeah, because obviously Lando finished 17th here and Piastri never finished. He did, well, Lando did several pit stops and then Piastri was having problems with the gearbox, I think. Yeah, Piastri was having a lot of problems and I think Lando also suffered a lot of issues as well. I think there was um, issues with the pneumatics which required a lot of stops and it sort of essentially just became a, a long, drawn-out testing session for them. Yeah, I mean, during the race, well, Piastri's race only lasted for 10, like 12 laps, but he was behind Lando by quite a bit at that point. There's not that much data to go on other than it's the fact that it's it's a bad car and it's Piastri's debut race. So for me, my first thought is a 5-2 for Lando. I think that would be fair as well. I think potentially later on in the season, you could argue a case for some of those better circuits where Oscar was quite strong, sort of maybe from Silverstone onwards. You can put more of a case that Oscar would be a little bit closer, but I think it's always going to be in favour of Lando. But yeah, I think you're right. I think he, from the little data we had, he was comfortably ahead of him in qualifying and probably would have finished ahead in the race as well. So I reckon 5-2 is probably, yeah, the, the fairest kind of judgment we can put on it. Mm. So a 1 or a 2 for Oscar Piastri, and everything else for Lando Norris. And it's a 1. Oh, First big upset, and Oscar Piastri goes through. Do we need to kind of justify that one in a way? I mean... Is it just a case of Piastri is better than Lando on the day? Or do we think maybe this is, you know, those issues that Lando has reoccur again? Yeah, if you want to throw mechanics or maybe just Lando has a useless start, I don't know, because he does that sometimes. We then move on to see who their opponent was and we drop back again to Sao Paulo in Brazil um, where we get Pato Award against Esteban Ocon. And I think we're returning to the realms of one comfortably in favour of the other. I mean, good for, for a war to kind of get through here, but... He's never raced at Sao Paulo. The one thing that maybe does help him a little bit here is that the McLarens were probably better than Alpine this weekend. Uh, well, they were a lot. They were a lot stronger. Yeah, I mean, on pace, wasn't far off Red Bull. Yeah, Lando's the second, and Oscar technically fourteenth, but that's with the whole shenanigans of losing a lap behind that early uh, red flag. So yeah, he would have been probably top five without that. But it was a good race for Alpine as well, in that well, they were just sort of in their no man's land bit. Yeah, they kind of just got on, marched away from sort of some lower grid starts and made their way into the points. But yeah, I think because because of Pato's experience, it ends up being close. Uh, lack of experience, rather, it ends up being closer than it should. Be. Yeah, I wonder. Initially, I'm thinking six and one, but I'm wondering the McLaren obviously has a big pace advantage in this situation. Too, so does it actually probably move more towards a five and two? I'd almost make it a four and three for award because the car is obviously better and he has he's done some fp1 i mean he's done testing in older f1 cars so he gets the mechanics of formula mm -hmm. one cars i guess how they operate it's because this is an especially strong circuit for mclaren i'm thinking a 4-3 in favor of award i agree that it's a, it's a strong one for mclaren i think what's holding him back here is that he's never been to sao paulo before so regardless of kind of the competitive level of machinery, you're asking someone to immediately jump into a car at a circuit they've not been at. So mm. I can't, th I, don't, I don't think the McLaren has enough of that advantage to really justify putting it so close to a ward, I don't think. I guess it depends if we, if in the scenario, if he's never driven the circuit, if he's literally never driven it, there's no practice, they just get thrown into a car and off you go. Yeah, that's fair. We didn't, yeah, we didn't establish that. I feel like... The spirit of the thing is that we are magically transporting around the globe and just dropping in at these 
circuits. So it's yeah. literally just a case of get in and go. We're not running a full Grand Prix weekend here. So I think, yeah, it does come with the caveat that Award has never done any track time at here. I think even for the ones that have done track time, you have to put in, there is the factor of acclimatization and even setup that they haven't done that. If it's like a neutral setup, but yeah, it's, it's still, it's still that lack of familiarity wouldn't, wouldn't help him. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to put it a, a five and two for Ocon, I think. Mm. Weighing in the fact that the McLaren is good, but it is counteracted by the person driving it doesn't have that experience to go with it. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So one or two for Pato Awards and everything else for Esteban Ocon. And it's a seven, so it is an easy win for Ocon. Next up, we are popping back to Suzuka as we see Nico Hulkenberg take on Lewis Hamilton. Yet again, a quite mismatched kind of pairing. You know, Japan was a real struggle for Haas. They were, I think they were the last of the finishers that day. And again, a typical rinse and repeat of what Haas struggled with all year. You know, tire deck problems kind of limited what they could do. And it was particularly harsh at Suzuka that year. Whereas Hamilton went from seventh to fifth kind of extracting the most you could probably could out of his Mercedes at that point. But it's polar opposites in a way. Yeah, it's another another very one-sided matchup. I I, th- I think it is a, a six and one. I'd, I'd like it to be closer, but I th- think you could ignore the fact that Hamilton is better than Hulkenberg. I think that's taken. I think he was better this year than Hulkenberg. And also the Mercedes is clearly much better than the Haas as well. Put them in a straight fight together. It's, it's really going to be Lewis winning the majority of the time. Yeah, and I mean, again, Lewis has, what, n- nearly 200 podiums and Hulkenberg has none. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hamilton's almost got as many podiums as Hulkenberg has starts. So, with, yeah, with, with that in mind, yeah. So a, a one for Nico Hulkenberg and everything else for Lewis Hamilton. And it's a seven again. Hamilton goes through. Will he see a rematch with his old teammates? Well, that's the next question. Valtteri Bottas is taking on one of our few remaining Friday practice drivers in Robert Schwartzman. And this is taking place in Azerbaijan. And again, it's that thing where Schwartzman's rocking up to the circuit. And actually, he's lucky in the sense that he's gone to a strong Ferrari circuit again. Mm. Leclerc was on pole here. The pair of Ferraris finished third and fifth, whereas it was a very stereotypical Alfa Romeo performance by the same stretch. 13th to 18th and then in the sprint 15th to 16th even if this is generally one of Bottas's stronger circuits because he won here in 2019 he was set to win in 2018 until he got the puncture 2017 he snatched second place from um Lance Stroll right at the last second Mm -hmm. even if he did have a massive stinker in 2021 but it's just it's just the difference in cars that makes it a, a Schwarzman too easy for him because Bottas really bad race starts and no race cross so even if he got ahead he wouldn't be able to stay ahead especially on a circuit like this absolutely I think the only thing you can argue in Bottas's favor he he, he does have obviously the more experience of racing but will struggle with that kind of race craft aspect of it he's relying more on the fact that either he can get by at the start or be the one in front and then hopefully Schwarzman makes an error or, or something like that I think less likely to crash but that's pretty much all he's got yeah I think so so where does that leave us odds wise? Six one for Schwartzman, I think. Yeah, I didn't expect Robert Schwartzman of all people to kind of be marching through this bracket at the ease that he is, but yeah, he's just getting some very favourable draws. It has to be said. Mm. And you know, and to his credit, it's not as if he ever disgraced himself, kind of in any of those free practice appearances. He's shown that he can get at the car and be reasonably competitive with it. Yeah. So a one for Valtteri Bottas and everything else for Robert Schwartzman. And it's a five. The unlikely march of Robert Schwartzman continues. Mm-hmm. Let's see how favourable his next circuit will be. We have the other Mercedes of George Russell, and he's taking on Felipe Drogovic in Hungary. Decent little drive from George in, in Hungary. He went from 18th to 6th, which was a good recovery. It was obviously not the best qualifying. That was more in part, you know, due to a little bit of errors from him, a little bit of errors from the Mercedes pit crew as well. Still a solid little race. Drogovic, meanwhile, foolishly did not put how well Aston Martin did. Uh, ninth and tenth. So relatively weak circuit for them. Yeah. So whereas before he had the benefit of, you know, I think it was Australia, stronger car. Now you definitely shift it in favour of Mercedes for this one. 
Mm. Looking at his F2 results, it was not a strong one for Drogovic either. You know, he's never been on the podium here. So it's not as if it's a circuit he loves and can be quite comfortable with quickly. Yeah. He's up against basically experienced and superior machinery. Yeah. So again, it's quite one sided. Is it six and one again? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think so as well. So a seven for Felipe Drogovic, everything else for George Russell. And it's a five. Russell becomes the second Mercedes into the quarterfinals. So on to our final last 16 match. And Sergio Perez thought he had it harder the first round. He now gets Charles Leclerc in the round of 16, going back to Austria. And this is a race where Leclerc came out on top compared to the two of them. Um, yeah. Admittedly, you know, with a lot of the, with the track limit shenanigans going on there, but... This was one of the poorer races from Perez this year. You know, really struggled in qualifying and only getting to third was kind of a disappointment, really. Yeah, I mean, he obviously had the race pace and that he made up for that, for qualifying, even if he was doing track limits a lot. But again, it was just underperforming in what the car can do because Leclerc was, I mean, Max still won it fairly comfortably, but this is one of his closer races and again, it had always been a good track for them because last year he managed to beat Verstappen outright. Mm-hmm. 2019, well, he lost the lead to, to Max Wright at the end. And he was very good here in, 20, in 2020, in the first race at least. When you take out the whole him starting 15 places further back or whatever, mm-hmm. it is much closer, but it's tricky. If it was Max, it would be an obvious win for Max, but because it's Checo, it's it's a 4-3, but I don't know which way. That's the problem. I'm inclined to go for Leclerc, if only because, yeah, I think Perez has the faster car at this point in time. And I think if you, you we were running this across a full race distance, I'd you know comfortably put it in favour of Perez. But because it's just those three laps, I, I think it gives Leclerc just a little bit of an advantage, knowing he's only got to hold on for those three laps. Like we say, he kn- he knows this circuit, he likes this circuit. Mm. This is one where he is good at knowing where people will attack, where he can attack, where he can defend, etc. Yeah, I think obviously Perez got past him in the, in the actual race itself, but I think. That is with other factors kind of going on there in case of just a straight shootout between the two. It takes him 10 laps when it would take Verstappen one. That's the thing. Like Perez really is not so good when he's on the offensive. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. And I think because he doesn't have that luxury here, he's more prone to making an error or going off. Obviously, this is one of the less forgiving circuits in certain areas that within that middle section. So there's a few more kind of gravel traps, which could obviously, which would effectively kind of kill the race really as soon as one of those goes in there. So. Yeah, I think 4-3, and and I'd I'd want to give it in favour of Charles Leclerc, I reckon. So, 1-4 for Charles Leclerc, 5-6-7, Sergio Perez. And it's a 6. Oh. So Sergio, I can imagine it being a a messy overtake, if anything. Yeah. A little bit of contact sending Leclerc into into a gravel trap or something like that. Mm-hmm. So our first quarterfinal is a reuniting of two old teammates as Pierre Gasly goes against Max Verstappen. I mean, once again, it's, try as we might, it's very hard to argue against Max Verstappen in particular this year. And again, this is a circuit where his opponent is not at his strongest. Even if they're in the same car, it's such an obvious win for Max because we've seen those two together in the same car and how that went. Yeah, this is one that absolutely relies on that kind of roll of the dice for Max to have that very rare mistake or mechanical fault or, or something like that. That's really the only way that this is kind of yeah, going around, I think. So, another 6 and 1 for Max? Yeah. So, a 1 would do it for Pierre Gasly, every other number will send Max through to the semi-finals. And it's a 4. As we suspected, Max is marching through the bracket at quite a lot of ease. We'll see if he gets unstuck in the next round. He will be facing either Oscar Piastri or Esteban Ocon, racing here at Belgium. So this was, again, this was another, well, sprint-wise, it was a stronger race for Piastri. He was battling for the lead and it eventually sort of settled back into second place. Race day, we didn't see anything at all. He was out on the first lap. Mm. compare that with Esteban Ocon left a little bit in the shade by Pierre Gasly this weekend Gasly was on the podium in the sprint Ocon couldn't quite match that on race day came home in eighth place but just a fairly average Alpine race yeah whereas 
McLaren had that little spark more, but I mean, mostly sort of just during the sprint, really. Yeah, I mean, in the race itself, Norris was, well, he was seventh, so he wasn't so so strong. Piastri had beaten him in the sprint fairly comfortably and probably would, in, in the race, maybe fourth or fifth. I mean, depends how he would have done against Mercedes. But again, it's it's the better car. Not drastically better, but still better. No, and not enough for us to put it as a, as a six and one. But I think, what a, a five and two for Oscar, be fair? Yeah. Let's do that then. One to five for Oscar Piastri, six or seven for Esteban Ocon. And it's a two. Oscar Piastri marches on. Our third quarterfinal, we have the surprise package of Robert Schwartzman up here against Lewis Hamilton. And we're doing it in Canada as well. Hmm. Um, so Canada, Lewis was third. The Ferraris, they were fourth and fifth. <laughs> so Mercedes definitely has the advantage, but what the overwhelming advantage has become the fact that it is Lewis Hamilton against a junior driver who's never going to get a look into F1. Yeah. He beats him already, you know, by the fact that the car is better. Yeah, only marginally better, but still, he doesn't really have a leg to stand on Schwartzman here. No, this is, this is maybe where it comes unstuck for him, I think. I think this is a 6-1 for Hamilton, I'm afraid. Yeah. A 7 would do it for Robert Schwartzman. Everything else, we'll see Lewis Hamilton move on through. It's a 7. Okay. <laughs> So Robert Schwartzman has defeated Lewis Hamilton. I think, let's see, Lewis has done his, you know, blind spot thing. He turns in on him at turn one and they lock wheels and Lewis spins off into the barriers because he didn't see him. Yeah. That's, that's what it'll be. That's, that's the only way I think we can justify it. Yeah. I mean, Lewis does have some dodgy starts every so often, but not, not massive howlers. And I could see maybe in three laps it would be difficult to get past again. Yeah, but uh, I, th- yeah, I think you're right. I think there's a mistake at turn one, gets it all wrong, and then it, you know it's too late to really think at that point Hamilton is either damaged at carrying on or you know the gap's too big between the two and, and Schwartzman can kind of cruise to an easy win. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, the dream run goes on for Robert Schwartzman. Um, we will see who he will face. Will it be George Russell or Sergio Perez? Um, this one is taking place at Silverstone. Hmm. Again, quite closely matched. They were fifth and sixth here. Yeah, I mean, Ch- Checo should have been higher up because the car was better. The thing is, Mercedes was strong here too, but just not as strong as Red Bull. Yeah. This is a circuit which for both of them, it's good. I mean, for George, it's good because it's Silverstone. I mean, last year he had the crash at the start. Checo, you know, 21 was pretty bad because he spun in the, the sprint and then did nothing. But then he had some good fight. He was doing some good fighting last year against Lewis, but again... He shouldn't have been fighting him, and the same with Leclerc. Mm -hmm. It is close, because both of them have got propensity to make mistakes. Either one of them could cause a crash at the start, or mess the start up. And you you can't tell how good they'd be fighting back if one of them loses out in three laps, if they could get past and actually make it work. Yeah, this is absolutely one of the ones where an incident is more likely than most. You can see it coming together, and it's who comes off a little bit better. Hmm. This is the thing, Perez should be better, but I mean, the statistics say he's not. The, the fact is that Russell finished ahead of him here. So do we kind of have to give the slight favour to George on, on that basis? Of the two, the, the one that's more likely to mess up the start is, is Checo. And again, because he's not so good on the offensive, he's less likely to get back past again. Yeah. So it's a, I think it's a 4-3 in favour of George. I think it's a 4-3 in favour of George as well. 1-4 to four for George. Five, six, seven for Sergio Perez. That's our first eight of the episode. Very exciting. (laughs) The tension builds. That's an eight again. Hmm. And it's a five. Sergio Perez. Falling upwards once again. On to the semi-finals. And the first one, Max Verstappen against Oscar Piastri. And it sounds promising in prospect until you realise that we're doing it in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. This only became weak for Verstappen because of his gearbox, but even then he still... Did he win? Or he finished second? He was second, yeah. This was, this was back in the early days when we thought, oh, we actually might get something interesting happen this year. I mean, he was overtaking people without DRS, where the year before he'd been playing DRS chicken with, um, with Leclerc, mm-hmm. and also with Lewis, possibly in 21. 
Um, yeah, it's a, it's a six one, and this is an especially bad race for. This is when McLaren were fighting with Alpha Tauri. Yeah, it's it's unlucky. Whereas you know it was great for that Oscar Bet was able to race at Qatar earlier on. And that was you know comfortably his best. This is very much kind of the inverse, the worst possible kind of circuit you could have had. You know, any other kind of driver, we might be having more of a discussion about whether it could have been a little bit closer, given this was you know Max's one of his least successful races, and it was only second. Mm. Yeah, I th- it's it's another another six one for, for for Max, isn't it? Yeah. So seven for Oscar Piastri. Everything else for Max Verstappen. It's a five. Verstappen into the final. Will he face his teammate Sergio Perez, or our surprise package of Robert Schwartzman in the Ferrari? Uh, we'll find out as those two duel at Cota. Hmm. Interesting again. Schwartzman bolstered a little bit the fact of that Ferrari was, I guess, one of their better ones. Sort of. They were just kind of invisible in the race. We saw very little of them because they just spent the whole thing tire saving and and that. Mm-hmm. And Science, you know, well, he ends up he gets third by default from Leclerc originally being third. And Checo again was so far behind. He, he but then Checo had a bad quality and he made hardly any progress. And again, he lucked his way into fourth. It becomes closer when you consider it Schwartzman is the thing. At the end of the day, Perez beats Leclerc on the track, even before Leclerc is disqualified. So it feels like saying that he then beats Schwartzman as well is, is not really that much of a stretch. Yeah. And again, we bring into, you know, the phrase, the word experience yeah. once more. You know, regardless of how scruffy Sergio can be, he is and will be kind of ranked as a better Formula 1 driver than, than Robert Schwartzman will. Yeah. I, th- I think it's a six and one for Sergio. Mm. So a one for Robert Schwartzman to somehow make it into the final. <laughs> Everything else for Sergio Perez. Oh, it's a two. Oh, all right. Oh, it was close, but not to be. <laughs> so I-, I guess in very much a mirror of the entire year, we have bigged up what could have been and, you know, the potential for some great racing. And we have ended up with the two Red Bulls. At the end. Mm. What's interesting is where this is happening because we are doing this in Miami. So this is still quite early on in the year when Sergio wasn't so quite categorically being beaten over the head by backs every single weekend. This was still at a time where there was rumours and whispers that, that maybe Perez could, you know, challenge for the title at this point in time. Yeah. Even so, this one, well, the thing is, Max didn't set a time in Q3, and I think that was because of Leclerc crashing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Max's Q2 time was faster than Checo's pole time. So without that, he would have, he more than likely would have got pole. And again, we saw in the race, it took one attempt for him to, to pass Checo for the lead from starting ninth, because again, Max can win from pretty much any position. Yeah. It's like an easy... I would say 6-1, but you have to factor in it's the same car, so maybe there is something that could work in Checo's favour, but I don't know what. Max has just beaten him psychologically as well. Yeah. I want to say 5-2. I don't know whether that's just me wanting to at least give a semblance of hope that this isn't just going to be a Max Verstappen cakewalk all the way. I feel like you can justify it in the sense that it's early enough in the season that Perez is probably still at one of his strongest kind of mentally. Yeah. Um, he, you know, the day he was... On pole, he was leading the race. I know we, you spoke about, obviously, there was the issues with, with Leclerc and qualifying that scuppers around that as well. And then and put into the fact that it is a street circuit as well. And I think you can just about kind of justify that it, it's 5-2 to Max. Mm. Max is the, is the comfortable favourite, but I think there's still enough of a discussion that can be had that you, you could see Perez w- winning this one. Yeah. Well, Magnussen qualified fourth here. I know, it's crazy to think about. And seventh by lap one. Yes. Um, so, yeah, the most hardest performance you could imagine. But yeah, in a, in a matchup with these two, I mean, Max sometimes has slightly poor starts, but Checo almost always does. Checo on the offensive is not getting past Max. And his, as good as his, defensing, his defensive driving is, it happens to be very weak against Max mm-hmm. in the few times we've seen it. He doesn't really have any, any weapons against Max, except at Baku. That was the only place where he beat him outright. I think, to give Sergio credit, I think he has that same kind of... Yes, he's the clear kind of number two in the team, but in much the way that occasionally a Barrichello or a Bottas could just pull an absolute worldie out of their backside, 
Sergio is more than capable of doing that too. You can't predict when it's going to happen, but when he is at his strongest, he, he can be really good. And if they, I mean, yeah, like I say, if there's anywhere it's going to be, it's going to be on a, a something like a street circuit. Yeah. So the final roll, one, two, three, four, or five for Max Verstappen, or a six or a seven for Sergio Perez. It's a one. <laughs> so none of the discussions matters. Well, you can say that about every, every race. None of the pre-race discussions matter. It's, it's Max again. <laughs> it's Max again. It doesn't matter where you put him. doesn't matter what situation we try and throw him in. He just can't be stopped. I mean, I didn't want to do another a, a tier list or, or a grading video or something like that. I think last year I compared all the drivers to Christmas movies and ranked them that way. <laughs> but yeah, I think... Anyone who isn't saying Max Verstappen was the best driver this year is kidding themselves or trying to find an excuse just to do something different from everyone else. Yeah. Says so me who organised this, this silly fantasy tournament with, with a die, but as good as year as, as other people had, it's, it's Max who's on top. We're like, we've never seen domination like this before. It's never been so easy for a driver to kind of dominate at the front. And I think we could all admit that you know, we, we anticipated or expected Max Verstappen to probably win the title again this year. I, I don't think anyone kind of saw it happen in, in this kind of way. Yeah, we, we thought maybe it would be different. I think that, again, the Ferrari fans always get hyped after they see their car and because they did the launch where they, they, they did the, the shakedown in the launch and it's always their year. And, you know, Mercedes, they said they were going to go for a new philosophy and then they build a car that looks exactly the same as the previous one. It was the fact that we knew basically straight away after Bahrain, it was clear where things were going. Even if Aston Martin were better, that was the only change. But otherwise, there was no real indication he was going to have much in the way of competition. Yeah. And there isn't much indication of that being the case next year, particularly as every driver lineup is the same and the cars are going to be basically the same. It, we're just going to be picking up where we left off. Yeah, if we do this again next year, we may be having a similar discussion at exactly this uh, this same point again with slightly different reserves yeah it's, yeah some different friday practice drivers and robert schwartz might not get all the way to the semi-final yeah but yeah that is the end of the tournament of champions if you listened all the way through in one go well done i'm very proud of you we certainly didn't do that we had a lunch break in the middle so full credit to you if you enjoyed this let us know in the comments we had a little discussion in the break we could potentially do something again like this for you know formula one champions in their championship winning machinery or every williams driver or a, a world cups kind of scenario or, or something like that so yeah if you enjoyed it let us know in the comments and we we'll potentially do another one again of these in the future but peter thank you so much for taking time out every day to to come and join me here for this this silly little venture yeah no thanks for having me on it was a uh, good fun and quite an interesting uh, thought experiment as well i was kind of picturing the races in my head and seeing how it would go just two cars on track and that. Yeah, it's, it's not far from sort of that, that little that meme-like video when Hamilton was just by himself on the start at Hungary. Yes. Just, just, yeah. just something akin to that in a way. Mm. But yes, a big thank you to Peter for coming on. Um, again, all of his links down there. Um, if you're not subscribed already, make sure you pop across to his channel, show him some love. But from the both of us, thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful holidays and a very happy new year. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, consider pulling into the pit box of my channel, bolting on the tyres of hitting that subscribe button and tearing off the fresh visor of hitting the like button. I've had word from the pit wall that it's the best strategy available for you.